This week on A Very Special Content Minded, I have a delightful conversation with my good friend Gifts Ungiven, video artist, painter, content creator, although that's probably a less than stellar word to choose, but an overall amazing artistic soul. We talk about the state of the contemporary art world, about online culture, and her expression and her unique insight into the nature of contemporary art, her experiences being a woman creator in dissident spaces, her insight into certain contemporary artists, and also in general, the nature of what it means to be someone in the online world interacting with the work of art in this day and age. It is a quite casual but quite meaningful conversation we have. So please join us as we celebrate the work of art and celebrate good content. naturally wait, so, wait yeah. so do you want do you i want do live video? streams but no do no i want... mean if you're if you're cool with video i'm thinking of like actually doing video but like because I, I remember i recorded the one with nina power but i'm like ah, nah, i don't know like it's i might as well just keep it like podcast format because like my patron like on patreon uh they're gonna get just the audio anyways because it's like <laughs> it's too much for like a video oh really um, no okay yeah like they give you a limit or something on Patreon, but like audio, like you could go for hours and hours. Like oh, apparently jerks. the bit rate in audio. Oh like, gosh. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah. So we'll just we'll just do this for now. I actually really wanted to do video because I, I personally feel that's better. But I yeah, I just I, I just if you want it, like even if it's just your bedroom, we could do video because like then the the YouTube portion could like go to video. Um, if we did video, no, no, or, it's not going to no? work. It, no, <laughs> no, no it, I, I, my I would fans be, would love to be an e-girl bedroom. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it's all right. No pressure. It's, um, uh, no, it's, it's, it's too far gone. I would need, I need, I need a solid two hours to get ready. <laughs> it's, like, you know, <laughs> it's really, it's so stupid. So I, okay. I, I sleep in. I, I definitely do. Oh yeah, and uh, and I I looked at the clock. I woke up a little bit before nine on uh, my time, obviously, and and I was thinking like, oh, could I sleep more? You know, like I, I'll have time to get ready. Then I can decide again if I want to do video or if I want to do audio. <laughs> and then and then I looked at the time and I was like, wait a second, oh. he said EST. <laughs> then I realized, yeah. oh no, uh -oh, uh -oh. Yeah. yeah, woman moment. <laughs> oh, oh, 100 percent. And then, oh, and then I looked, I looked, I had to check, and sure enough, it was EST. And I was like, well, I guess that decides it. I'm only doing, I'm only doing audio. So, if you um, wanted to record yeah. later, I would have been cool if you were too, like you know, morning brain. But that's, but you're already in it. We're in it. We're mm. already in it. Might as well. Yeah, In, unless you want to do video, then I, I could, I, I could ah, leave okay. and come back. But I think we're, I think we're good. Yeah, we're cool. We yeah. will have to do this again. I can tell. Oh, everybody. definitely, definitely. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh boy! So we have gifts on given. Gifts on. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> I might keep that. Um. Anyways, um, I think you should keep it. Yeah. Oh, I used to be in a band, but that was many moons. What ago. You used to be in a band? Yeah. Like I, I used to do a bit of death metal uh, growling. Oh, but, yeah. really? Yeah. yeah. So oh, that's many so moons funny. ago. That was so funny because I was, I when I was walking downstairs to get my coffee, I was thinking, should I bring up Megadeth to G? Oh, there you go. Is that wait wait is Megadeth? Is that they're they're like well depends what era of Megadeth P pretty much like thrash or like oh, man I already sorry. sound like a nerd. Sorry about that. Oh no problem. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry. Yeah yeah yeah. Um, I, I can't imagine Dave Mustaine growling very much nowadays. But wait, say that again. Okay. 
Um, Mega <laughs> the the first the first era of Mega. They're like classic thrash, but then they get into like other things with like depending on the guitarist they have at the particular time. But yeah, mostly they're known for thrash. Mm, okay, so thrash. Oh wow. So so um what was this band? How long were you in it for? Oh, this was like after high school. This was like because my my best friend in real life, he's like a he's like a pretty crazy like um guitarist and musician, but like he does everything himself, kind of like kind of like Varge or like other like one man bands. Um and we like did this project together, but it never went anywhere. Um, but oh. like I used to be like in the quote unquote scene um a lot, but yeah, you know. What so what did what did you play? Like what, what... Well, I played a bit of bass, but I was mostly a vocalist because like I actually went to school oh. and everything, like for a little well, a little bit. Like I took lessons here and there. Oh, but like cool. Yeah. But but like of course, like I'm much more attuned to like what I do, which is visual art. But yeah, you know, same. I mean, yeah, yeah. Um, and so like, yeah, yeah, my, because like music has a very particular, like you have to be a very particular person and, uh, you know, I, I feel like people are different, like different artists are, I guess they're suited to their medium out of some kind of like, um, inner necessity, you could say. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know where I'm going with that thought, uh, but uh, <laughs> I, no, 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 <laughs> uh, I, I think that's interesting. Um, I, well, I, I'm actually trying to figure that out right now. Uh, I, I like making videos, but I also like making music. I, I like painting too. Um, I started off as a, a portrait painter. That was really I, was, I didn't know that. Actually, yeah, I actually went. I actually went to university, um, art school to to you know become a, a portrait painter, but. Uh, yeah, that didn't end up working out just because just because the art school was so ridiculous. It, I, I I dropped out. So, um, but did but, you yeah. go to like a legit art school or an atelier? Um, I well, I I wanted to go to there was RISD I was considering. Oh yeah, oh, and yeah. like Cal Arts. Um, and then, and then I finally decided that I was, I, I wanted to go to like one of the legit Italian schools for like sculpting and painting. I have a friend that went to one in Milan. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, that, it, yeah. That's so cool. Um, it like, I, I, I really wanted that experience, but my parents, they were, they were scared of me going off to Europe on my own, which I understood cause I was, you know, really young. They, they so, have some good American ones too. Like they have, uh. The, the one that Jeffrey Watts runs is pretty decent. Jeffrey Watts, not familiar. Yeah, he's on YouTube. He, he, I think he used to work for Disney, um, oh. but then he like gave it up to become like a legit portrait painter. Um, and like, there's there's a few other ones. I mean, of course, the best ones are in like either uh, Italy or Russia, or I mean, there's some good ones in England. Yeah, but I mean, I don't know. I I thought about going to art school, but like by the time I I did grad school and you know, doing continental philosophy, it's sort of like redundant because like in art school, they have a very like reduced like theory courses. Well, that, yeah. yeah. Um, well, to answer your original question, I ended up going to a local university, mm. uh, the state university. Um, and uh, I actually noticed what, what you just said. So, you know, I started taking studio classes um, and uh, and I, I imagine it wouldn't be much different had I gone to RISD. Uh, it, it, it really came down to the philosophy and art history of, of like, 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 that was actually the most important stuff I found. Mm -hmm. um, the studio classes are kind of irrelevant and actually can be a detriment, even if you go to like Cal Arts or something like that, because you end up, um, everybody develops the same style. So like what's yeah, the point? Especially Cal Arts, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. If you go to one of their like the the graduation shows where they have all of the students students art, they all just look like the top professors art. So like what what what's the point in that? So yeah, I realize yeah. that it's it's about the philosophy 
and and about um, uh, the art history aspect of things like that's way more important so you might as well just get like a philosophy slash art history degree and that would do yeah. better yeah um i like i mean i'm i'm also like critical of ateliers i mean i know this is probably just cope for my own like <laughs> um lack of technical mastery and what i do i mean i don't know like i mean uh, i think like the pr the problem with a lot of like classical realism like a lot of art, art renewal center stuff is that like i know people like they love the wow gee whiz of a factor of like a portrait or but like a lot of a lot of ateliers if they're run by a prominent artist they also have that same detriment like for example um if you're a student of odd nerdum if you like actually pay like a ton of money to like go i actually have to i have to stop swearing now because i just got monetized on youtube so i have oh. to like edit out the swears yeah <laughs> um <laughs> Yeah, uh, but like, okay, I'll you, be careful. <laughs> no, no problem. No problem. I, I really personally don't, I like swear like a sailor. It's just that, you know, it is, it is a pain to like go and edit it <laughs> like with the bleeps. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, if you go to like an atelier with a prominent master and you're actually like, like if you, if you go to, I believe, where is he? Denmark or Netherlands or, um, like someone like, like all the students of odd nerdum, they basically paint like odd nerdum. See? <laughs> like, that, it, it, yeah. yeah, it's the same. Well, okay, so um, if Francis Bacon, the the, paint, the painter, oh, yeah. um, he's uh, he's fantastic and huge he, influence. Wow, it's funny you saying that. Oh my god, I want because <laughs> well, Francis Bacon's a huge influence on me. But I figure like because I was listening to your stream with Endeavor, and mm -hmm. I'm like, oh man, I want. There's a lot of points I wanted to like. Uh, critique but I, I i didn't i wouldn't peg you as a francis bacon fan put it that oh way. i i yeah. love francis bacon uh francis bacon was one of um one of one of the first painters that i really really got into like I, well initially it was uh um it was more of like the more classical you know traditional type of thing but later i i developed taste in other ways and bacon was one of the first ones but, but what i was gonna say is bacon he he just he didn't even go to art school no. he actually yeah. ditched out on that whole thing and uh i think he worked for like an advertisement company for a short period it was something like that it was a very boring job yeah and yeah yeah. So, so, and, and and I remember thinking when I, when I read that, you know, on his biography, it, well, there you go. You know, like you're, you see all of these art students coming out of art school, they all look the same. And, and then you get bacon and a lot, there's other people too, that like, they didn't go to art school and they actually ended up making better art than the people went to art school. So I actually think it's to your advantage to not have gone to to art school it, yeah, well, yeah even like nowadays like a good predecessor of frank bacon would be john virtue um and he like was a mailman and he would like go to his route but then he would stop in london and he would um do these very like quick and brief no tan sketches of the skyline along the thames um along you know castle windsor uh and like then he would translate that into like his you know very like vast monochrome paintings mm. um and in his particular style uh and of course you know later on if you're good enough like you receive fellowships and all that um oh but, cool wait well what was his name again uh john virtue john virtue yeah i think they like his landscapes yeah let me take a look john... so he was uh a yeah he was a mailman i think yeah and, but, like and, how was he associated to Bacon? But like he came, he was part of the sort of painters that came, um, it, you know, after the eighties, after um, the sort of school, the sort of European artists like Bacon and uh, Lucian Freud. And like, then I guess mm -hmm. in Italy, you had the trans avant-garde who basically kept painting alive during the eighties. And like, yeah. I mean, you, you also have like, um, the newer ones who I guess you would say are more like woke ones, the ones in one of your videos you alluded to, um, like people like Jenny Savile and Cecily yeah. Brown. And uh, like, well, I want to, I, yeah, I want to I get into your history, actually. I think it's really basic out of the way. Um, 
So, uh, oh, how do, <laughs> how do I ask this? Um, well, first of all, how did we? I, I don't know how we found each other. I don't know how that happened. Oh, um, I, I added you on Twitter. I think it all on, 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 on the Twitter. Yeah. And that's, all, <laughs> that's how it happened. What do you think of this Twitter? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but 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 yeah, I just before you go on, I actually really do like this, by the way. And that oh. era of of painters that you just mentioned, they're they're the more interesting ones, obviously. Like oh yeah, like, you know the '60s era painters. They they they're, they're kind of following in like um, Pollock's you know footsteps. I'm not really a big fan of that stuff. But yeah, when you get to the to the '80s and the '90s, that's when things start to get interesting. But I actually had a realization the other day. I uh, paintings and movies they're like they're very intertwined and if you like mm. if you are you are do you know who P.T. Anderson is I think I've heard of the name um F4. yeah so so like the 90s like the music the movies and the paint the paintings oh, yeah. are all very oh, yeah. similar like they have it's all like grunge for the most part it's like that grungy like just to come at it from like a musical perspective it's all, it, it's really weird how they're all very similar. Like Lucy and Freud is kind of like a P.T. Anderson film. It's very like, oh, long, yeah, really. yeah. It's very raw. It's very un, like noir and underground. And yeah. Isn't yeah. that funny how they're all kind of like they, they, like they, more so like the movies and the paintings, they were kind of doing the same thing. It just, oh, yeah. It, it's oh, a yeah. dead end. And I think it's navel gazing. That's, that's what I call it. But, but I mean, it's got its merit. I just don't think it's a, like on a large scale. I, I I don't feel like it helps society in making. Well, like a lot of those New Line that. Cinema films that they were making, like like even the ones he directed, like Boogie Nights or Magnolia, mm -hmm. um, like the later stuff. I mean, Inherit Vice was pretty good, but that was like much much later. That was like you know, um, haven't seen but, that one. Yeah, like I mean, there is other stuff that wasn't fitting the bill like uh what was the one he did punch drunk love uh like like stuff like that i mean but the the 90s ones that he did like they like um that had that gritty edginess to it like hard eight uh boogie nights you know do, um what do you think about boogie nights just on that note just for like it was all right it, it was all right like i think that um well first of all like they highly embellish the story because apparently John Holmes is like a notorious, was that his name? John Holmes uh, was like a notorious liar, but um, the, is was that the, the director, the porn, the porn star that they uh, were oh. spoofing? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. And um, uh, yeah. Yeah. And uh, like, the, well, his history is kind of like interesting, but like, like Boogie Nights was a really good representation. I think of like, the sort of like late seventies decay, like early eighties, late seventies that was, that was like going on at the time. Um, so would you say it's a good film? Oh yeah. It's pretty, it's, it's a key. Yeah. It's Kino it's pretty, in that regard. Yeah. It's pretty master masterfully done. Oh. Uh, even if it is degenerate, it's, it's hilarious. The movie, <laughs> the movie, yeah. they, they, it's such a, a fantastic balance of being funny, but also just being horrifying all at once. It's, it's really good, but it, it, you know, it's coming from like cultural degeneracy. I mean, like, that's the point it's about, you know, you know, porn, the porn industry, but um, I do think it, it is a good film because, you know, this, that was actually something that Endeavor and I were discussing was whether or not, you know, like a more like postmodern film, if you will, could oh, yeah. be could be good. And and I, I well, I mean, you have to kind of like decide what good actually means. Is it just entertainment or is it doing something more for society? I don't know. I feel like I feel like uh, PT PT Anderson films, you know, can give us something more than just being entertainment. So I, I think it's pretty good, but. Yeah, it's, but that's funny you mentioned about the like how the '90s, how aesthetically, like a lot of like very um, transformational things were happening in the art world, along with culture, and like for example, you have like the introduction of video art and like people like mm -hmm. Pavarotti 
Like, it's funny in some ways. I mean, I know she does, like, you know, she'll, like, get naked or whatever. But, like, if you actually look at some of her, her work that she was doing, like, some of her, um, what did she call it? Like, it's, like, these series of rooms that have, like, video projectors everywhere. And there's fabrics. And there's, like, nature. And there's um, a really immersive experience in terms of light and sound and image. Like, it's almost like what you're doing reminds me of Pepilotti, only, like, you know, sans the nudity and, like, the proto, like, woke stuff. But it's very funny how, like, uh, like what she wanted to do as, like, an immersive experience and, like, almost like a proto form of asthma or something, like, ASMR. Who is this? Pepilotti is, like, this, what is she, Dutch or something? I forget where she's from, an artist. But she's, like, she was one of the first, like, um good like video artists that came out of like the 80s and 90s along with like you know nam jun pike and like other ones um and so like yeah they there was a lot of like experimentation going on um in in terms of like the visual landscape then of course you do have like painters and of course you have the like, young british artists i mean i'm you know i've written articles things like that about like tracy eman and mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah she's she's Nerd. great <laughs> I have, a, I have a, I have a Patreon only episode actually of my uh, Mario Madness series uh, on her tent, her pop, um, you know, the tent everyone yeah, I've ever course. been intimate with. Yeah. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I think, yeah, it's really, <laughs> uh, but it's, ha have you yeah. seen, have you seen the interview with her? You must have seen it. The yeah, one yeah, 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 the yeah, tape, yeah, 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 uh, yeah. Yeah. And, and Roger Scruton <laughs> is there. Oh yeah, that's right. And, and he's like trying to grill her. Yeah. Yeah, and she's really drunk and she's acting like an idiot. And and he's like he's roasting her and it's just like the best thing ever. And at the time when I when I saw it like many, many, many years ago, I didn't know who that was. Cause like he hadn't blown up yet. But um yeah, that was great. Um I, I, she, I think she won. Yeah, yeah, she did. She won yeah, the Turner Prize. Yeah, yeah she won the Turner Prize. Not, yeah, not that year, but like a, a different not year. The, anyway, I what think was it was ninety five for the bedroom. Yeah, something. I, I believe it was for the bedroom. I think. I think um, that sounds about right. I think I painted the bedroom once, or I did like a little. Painting do you of it. secretly? Do you secretly dig her work? Do some you? in some okay in some <laughs> in some regards. Um, I wrote this article back when I, before I did Substack, I did the like, the WordPress thing. This is like, you know, way back in the day. Mm -hmm. um, this, I think it was 2017. It was when she came out with her newer paintings in White Cube. And like, I mean, of course, they're not like technically proficient or anything. But like, they, mm -hmm. they show, I think, like a sort of redemption in her. Like, she's very um, consciously aware of the fact of like, her influence and like her sort of proto like um like, like her sort of influence upon like younger millennial well not younger now i mean aging millennial now but like you know our generation yeah um like the sort of like millennial damaged girl like i'm a hot mess like her sort of influence yeah. like that she's consciously aware of that and she's also consciously aware of um the relationship she had with her mother and of course her um she she which i was like shocked at because this i mean if it was any other artist if if it was a lesser sort of well-regarded artist she probably would have gotten canceled for this um her mm. like regret um again youtube purposes especially after the recent court decision um mm -hmm. her regret over a certain uh, medical procedure that she had multiple times and oh. uh yeah so it's it was very interesting in that regard oh that's interesting yeah, yeah. And uh, of course, like, I think my thesis, is especially about the, um, the the tent, because she had this thing where she didn't want, um, she didn't want, what's his name, the famous art, the art dealer, um, oh. Nakagoshin uh, in England, what's his name? The, the, the New York guy? The one no, no, he's in England. Practice? He's in England. Um, oh. Sachi, Sachi, Sachi. Oh, Sachi. He, she, she didn't want Sachi to buy the tent because he did <laughs> advertisements for Margaret Thatcher. But in my oh. thesis, I think that, like, what happened was a handler probably just, like, told her to, like, just do that for, like, you know, good girl points. 
because like i i truly believe that like because she hates the term like feminist artist and because she like doesn't like to read into like her own work um it's very like Mm -hmm. much confessional right like that's another bane of like the millennial psyche is like the confessional article i personally believe that tracy eman is not very political as a person that she's just doing it (laughs) because like some handler told her like oh yeah well people hate margaret thatcher so you gotta do (laughs) oh without question yeah Yeah. no i'm i'm sure i i I hate to say this but i mean she the lady doesn't seem like super bright or anything (laughs) Uh, i'm sorry i don't want to be a jerk but i mean come on yeah yeah uh and these people they She's a shrewd businesswoman, though. I gotta admit, shrewd well, businesswoman. Y- yeah, uh, they definitely, uh, you know, yeah. If you watch a Robert Hughes, uh, you know, documentary like uh, the one, um, what's it called? Um, oh, he um, revisited Shock of the New. Not the Shock of the New. It's the um, I always for- forget. Oh, Mona Lisa's Curse. Oh yeah, that one. That yeah, is yeah, such yeah. A, such a good documentary because it. He, he he goes over how like like the art world is this business and how that's what it's become and that's actually in my opinion very symbolic for everything that's happening like everything has become about money of course mm. uh but but yeah it's really interesting because you'll see you know it, there's a, there's a a part in the documentary where it there there's this lady and she's talking to these rich people and she gives them uh advice about what paintings they should be buying what art they should be buying and and that's her her sole job is is to do that like she's this middleman that you know she she just like tells them oh this is in right now you should buy this or you should buy that which is just it, utterly ridiculous i mean you're Mm. you are buying art and you need this person to tell you what you want to buy and so obviously that goes to illustrate that it's all very business oriented and it's not anything to do with like the taste that you have for something or like your passion for art but anyway all all i'm saying is going back to to tracy it 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 really is a business that's that's what it is like they, these people they understand there's a political agenda and stuff like that and that's like an aspect of things but yeah the art world at at, at this point um i mean it's definitely about it's almost like a piece of real estate that you're buying you know when you buy yeah. uh, a painting yeah. or something it's not really about furthering aesthetics or you know something spiritual yeah 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 i mean and i know that's like a a common criticism i think like there are contemporary artists like on the lower levels who are doing very interesting things but like i mean the 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 thing is is that when you do get to a position like for example uh last year me and uh me and my friend matthew um we have this other podcast series style talks where we just talk about the work of art and we did this um episode on the sanford biggers statue at the um or is it at the Rockefeller Center? Yeah, yeah. Mm. Um, and the thing is, like, it that does have a history within things like African American cartooning and remix culture and all that. But the the real thing is that when you look at the statue, it pretty much is kind of like, I mean, it's part of his what he calls his Chimera series, which is like, you know, putting this like very cartoonish, um, like African American kid head on a greek bust like or at least Mm -hmm. a greek greek pillars it's like that's a conscious like subversive subversive thing which i mean it's funny because like i wrote this big thing about it too and my 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 one friend vile on twitter um i got like something like 100 likes at the time or something but my friend volunteer went bro what the hell is this and he got like ten thousand likes and he always rubs it in my face i'm like you he's like you wrote a whole bit, like thread essay on it and he it's like i just said bro with the wtf and it was like <laughs> <laughs> but it's true i mean something i think some things like people immediately know like what's going on and uh like because it's funny because some of his other artwork is interesting but it still has that like tinge of like you know, it's funny how he's talking about like, oh, I moved to Harlem, even though like 
I'm like, you know, he's like, I'm not going to lie. I'm a kid of privilege, but like I, you know, moved to Harlem to experience like the Harlem Renaissance artists and what they went through. And like, even though I'm like a, oh no, like African-American diaspora to like what they're doing. Mm. It's like any, you know, of course, married a very rich, like um, what's like uh, Wall Street person. It's like, yeah, I mean, there's always the sort of uh, the push to like, like there's always the push there to do like very particular things. Um, and I wanted to get into like, um, like Brown and, and, uh, and Jenny Savile in particular. Mm. Uh, but like, before we do that, so if you have anything to say on that, because I do want to ask you like, uh, I guess your origin story, uh, if you oh, have yeah. one. <laughs> yeah. We yeah. Past, yeah. We, we yeah. were going to bring that up and then, and then I interrupted. I'm sorry. No, 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 no. <laughs> um, okay. So did you, but you know the statue I'm talking about, right? The, uh, the, it's called, um, I think it's just called Chimera and it's like a number cause it's a series. It's part of a series. Could you, could you link it to me? Sure. Let me, let me send it to you. Um, the Sanford Biggers, uh, let's see. Yeah. Cause I want to know what you're talking about. I'm not sure. Even his name though. Like that's, <laughs> <laughs> oh, even his name. I remember people were like, um, we're going nuts about it. Uh, let's see. Oh boy. There there was um let me see Camara Rockefeller. And it's funny because me and Matthew we were um talking about and you know Matthew he's a great portrait artist himself actually. You know Matthew the Stout on Twitter? Mm, I, th I think actually. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Usually I like think me like usually with if it's me then it, <laughs> it's like one goes with the other i'm sorry um, i'm actually just new to this community so oh no problem no problem yeah so if you look at the chat i sent you the link um yeah this one i think you probably remember this because like it was pretty big on twitter oh, for, like, a few days. yeah uh, wait <laughs> so okay so what are you saying about this that this is oh, awesome oh. are you making are you making an argument for this too geo no 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 um, I'm saying like it's important because like what we were talking about uh, in that podcast it's I think it's episode five of style talks um mm. we were talking about how if you look at the history of the artwork at the Rockefeller Center how it basically determines the chorus by which America goes for mm. example they have the Prometheus th that statue so there's a Prometheus one there's of course the famous oh wait Okay, he's gone, he's gone. Um, the famous um, Diego Rivera mural, you know, the communist one. Or, well, it wasn't just communist. It was like sort of like this weirdo, like commie futurist um, painting where he's got like the Giga Chad. Um, it, I think it's called, um, was it called The Course of Time? The one where he's on this like machine and there's like the path to the future, which of course has a lot of communist themes and of course makes you wonder why like, the Rockefeller family is paying for like so, a communist Diego Rivera to paint this mural. This but, was the the one that they had before this current piece. The, yeah, these are the ones they oh. had at the Rockefeller Center. I think they still have them. They still have the Atlas one. They have Prometheus. Oh, um, unfortunately, the Diego Rivera one was painted over, and they put in the statue of um, a representation of. William Blake's Erizen, which is like the uh, deity of reason. Um, oh, it's, no. oh, no. Yeah. <gasps> yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, when I think they, did they do that? This was like in the, was this the 80s or something? I have to look. If you look up the history of that Diego Rivera mural, like they have this whole um, history behind it. Because it very is, it's a monumental piece of art. It, it really truly is. If you look up the Diego Rivera mural, um, so basically, like all of the Rockefeller center pieces determine, I think the picture of America, like, or the new American century as it reflects upon itself. Mm -hmm. and, and so when you see like Atlas, then you see that mural, you know, the, what, I think it's called, the, it's called the course of time or something. Or uh, then you see like, you know, Irizan, you see like Prometheus, then you see the Sanford bigger statue. Like Wait, that clearly, did they yeah. do a Jeff Koons? Or is, uh, is that not? 
Yeah, I think they, the yeah, I think Jeff Koons was actually, they, he had a piece at the Rockefeller Center. I wouldn't put it past him. Oh. But because um, the Sanford Biggers one was like a temporary loan. Um, and so I, it's made like so many thousands of pounds of bronze or something. So you have this like conscious spoofing of the European tradition with this sort of like new American ethnogenesis. Yeah. And I think like, the artwork itself is disastrous and subversive, mm-hmm. but like in terms of what the sort of people at the center of the new American century, what they truly like think is the direction. I think like my argument and me and Matthew's argument was that it's of monumental importance to like, okay, why is it that this artist above all, all else are like, cause if you have a piece at the Rockefeller center in America, as you know, like you can't get any higher more or less. Like the, that's like, you've done it. Like the only equivalent would be like, if you won the Turner prize or if you won, um, if you did like a clearing at South Bees, like other than that, like mm-hmm. that's the highest that's there's no higher. <laughs> like literally yeah. like that's yeah, gotcha. the world, the world heavyweight world heavy Q championship <laughs> <laughs> of the art world. Um, yeah, I got gotcha. so- No, that makes a lot of sense. And that's actually a really interesting observation. I, I never really paid attention to it. Um, the memes are hilarious, uh, by the way. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking at them now. Uh, oh no, he's back. <laughs> yeah, no. Yeah. <laughs> 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 the day of all days, my God. So many technical issues. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah. So <laughs> Oh man! So, so wait, me- one la- wait, one last thing. So, yeah, so you were saying that they they put um, like a lady of reason or something in the oh they um, put they put the god of reason the, um, the goddess the bo- of reason. Is it the god of? I think it's a male figure. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Like basically, oh. it's from the William Blake um, print from Heaven and Hell of his own created mythology, Arizan. Like it's not. It's not specifically it is in, but it's like it's intended not. to the same. Yeah, it's intended to be like the same figure. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. I believe that's what they put over the uh, Diego Rivera mural. Um, yeah. Rockefeller mural. Oh, yeah. The Man at Crossroads. That's what it's called. Man at the Crossroads was a fresco by Diego Rivera in New York City's Rockefeller Center. Originally stated to be installed in the lobby. And then, um, of course, like the famous Rothko that uh, was in Nelson, was in Nelson's Rockefeller's um, studio. Yeah. Um, oh, my God. Called it anti-capitalist propaganda. Rivera added images of <laughs> Lenin and the Soviet made a parade in response. Was discovered Nelson Rockefeller at the time, a director of the Rockefeller Center, wanted Rivera to remove the portrait of Lenin, but Rivera was unwilling to do so. In May 1933, Rockefeller ordered the mural to be plastered over and thereby destroyed before it was finished, resulting in a protest and boycotts by other artists. Replaced by a mural from Joseph Maria Sert, three years later, only black and white photographs exist of the original, but I think people have done uh, color mock-ups since then. Mm. Um, So it was replaced with, um, let me see, uh, yeah, Joseph Maria Sert. I believe it was the... uh, yeah, the the uh, Arizan one. Um, let's see. Yeah, um, so there was a big controversy. I remember at the time it was like, yeah, I think it was in the thirties. Um, but yeah, that that it, it's funny because like that man at the crossroads, I feel is like sort of. Um, yeah, I mean, it, of course, he meant like a communist utopia, mm. but it really was indicative, I think, of like the ideal of like, you know the American project being equated with like the enlightenment and like basically the God of reason overcoming the um, superstitions and the conflicts and the sort of primitivism of the past. And, and in some ways I think it's an embodiment of like futurism of that particular era. I mean, not, of course not like yeah. uh, the other based varieties of futurism, but like, uh, <laughs> you know, um, but yeah, yeah. Um, it's it is a shame though that they destroyed it though. I mean, it it is a shame it got plastered over. Um, but it's I, it's just a scary thing when they uh, when they erect a uh, 
a, a goddess or a god of reason because like the the last time well actually we have one i i think well she's a light bearer but that's the statue of liberty um but in in france during uh the when was it um the french revolution they put yeah. up a, a goddess of reason yeah and in in the name of the goddess of reason like 300 thousand uh native french people got got killed and like beheaded and beheaded and stuff it's it, yeah that, that is a scary thing uh is the is the statue of liberty do you know if that's a they, goddess of reason yeah they have like some like allusions to that being like the like light of uh of reason and being like some kind yeah. of like pre-masonic symbolism going on um yeah like i mean but the thing is i noticed like it, it is kind of like frustrating i mean i'm not an american i'm unfor unfortunately i'm not an american <laughs> um i'm i'm way worse i'm, I'm a leaf uh You're but like leaf. yeah i know it's terrible um <laughs> It's one day, one day I'll probably end up moving to America one day, but like and an Italian leaf. I uh, know. Right? Are you Italian? Yeah, exactly. Your name yeah. Suggests yeah. An Italian leaf that that's a little bit of a weird one. How did this happen? There's a lot of us here. Um, oh. <laughs> well, like I know, like a lot of them stayed after they came from Ellis Island. They like they stayed there, oh. but um, like uh, yeah, like uh, they're there's something about like, I, I think like uh, Americans that I know, like they do have like a very like touchy um, and rightfully so like relation to the founding of America, because I think like if you give into the interpretation, which I think is a valid interpretation that America was, you know, essentially an enlightenment project and that it was founded by Freemasons and that it has yeah. from its inception a very like, a contrary tradition and deistic uh, relationship to um, the old world. And, and there's sort of like an inherent antagonism, especially being like a Catholic. I mean, Catholicism was always a shaky thing in America for a very long time, even though um, I, I was talking about this with my friend, Josh Neal, who's a great writer. Um, like he, you know, about how America, there is a strain of Catholicism in America because of just how old it is. But I think of in course. terms of like, yeah, but in terms of like the inception of America, there is like a lot of contentious things from a quote unquote traditionalist perspective. But then the problem is that if America is like really like one of the last outposts of sanity left in the world, at least like certain pockets of America are the out, not the American government, certainly, and not like the American ruling class, but like in terms of like the people and certain aspects of America being like the only real source of sanity left in the western world uh well but then again there's this other great power that is sort of being cut off from the west but uh, it's not <laughs> not gonna get into that one no, <laughs> you know what i'm alluding to um <laughs> but um i mean i don't know well i don't know your uh position on the blue yellow conflict but uh the yeah, blue yellow. oh yeah yeah but i i'm kind of paranoid about youtube so I'm oh oh <laughs> no problem yeah no problem <laughs> <laughs> sorry but um sorry about that well, i should have caught that i should have no, no problem <laughs> <laughs> they even added it to the imperial the flag one. yeah yeah they even added it to the imperial flag the blue and yellow did you see that that's oh man that's hilarious that's i feel so like i do really feel bad for people that are suffering and like the fact that they're being used as a prop by the uh the GAE, yeah. um, you know, I mean, they're putting it on, like putting it on the flag. I mean, adding Wait, but, the, the, you didn't see this. They added the rib, the blue and yellow to the uh, stripes on the, uh, the Imperial flag. <laughs> no, I did not. Yeah. Yeah. It's terrible. It's, <laughs> it's just getting, it's just getting more and more ridiculous. It doesn't even surprise me anymore. Like, <laughs> like clown world type stuff. I'm just, I'm not even surprised at this point. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, but you I mean, your, to go back real fast, you made an interesting point. Well, well early America is a very, um, it's a very misunderstood time period. I'm still, I'm still trying to figure it out, but yeah. uh, it, 
it really does come down to a, a war of, of, of religions and, you know, these, like you have the Protestants and, and then you have, yeah, some Catholics, but they end up coming later. But the, the two, the two groups that are really fascinating are, are of course, like the founding fathers who are like deists and stuff like that. And they're, it, it really all comes down to, in my opinion, these, these two groups of people, the Protestants and, and the, um, uh, these deists, uh, enlightenment type thinkers wanting to escape the Catholic church, honestly, because like, you know, there were, there were so many beheadings and, and things went so awry. That's not to say the Catholic church has always been bad or whatever. I just think that, you know, a rot eventually sets into just about anything given enough time. Well, the but, war, yeah, the wars of religion in, in Europe, that was certainly a big motivator for a lot of the, um, settlers like the Huguenots and then other settlers that came from, uh, from largely Lutheran Protestant Calvinist, uh, like there are, there are different like European strains in America. Then of course you have the more like Germanic Lutheran strain of America. You have yeah. the Anglo, certainly the Anglo strain. Um, and America is like among these like Northern and Central European countries um, becomes this sort of amalgamation but then later like us you know southern southern europeans came along and that like created its own like unique ethnogenesis and like they're still um i mean they're pretty much gone now but like the wasp establishment in america um always sort of found itself having like a supreme anxiety about its own like relationship to other european groups or even well that other group, which shall, shall remain nameless. Uh, but you know, that <laughs> like, that's not, well, that was another history about how their relationship to the wasp overclass. Um, but yeah, yeah. So America from its beginning is very, very complex in terms of like its ethnicity and its ideals. And it's like, there's so much like mythology built up around America that it's very hard to like, um, pinpoint okay what is the narrative i mean i think people there's a general sort of like common sense aspect of like okay this was america's ideals but nowadays i mean there 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 is like being this like active like revisionism not like a based way but like i mean like actual revisionism towards like america oh i think i lost you let's see did Hello? i lose you for a second yeah I, yeah I don't know if it was me or if it was you. Probably me. Oh, um, yeah, maybe. Yeah, that happens. Sometimes you kick yourself. Um, but anyways, yeah. So what were we going to say about America? Uh, yeah, so so I, I just think that that time period is really, it's very misunderstood. And I think it's actually crucial that we, we that we, we really understand um, exactly how we feel about that time period, early America, because it's it's kind of it it has set the tone for everything that's happened, obviously. And I think a lot of people are confused about like where we're supposed to go next. You know, some people think that the 1950s is when oh that was the the peak, and they 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 kind of associate that with you know like yeah. the beginning. And in my opinion, the 1950s is like the, it's like the, I mean, we, we had already started, started to fall at that point uh, into what we are, what, what we've become, but the 1950s is a obviously, it, it's a symptom of something that happened in the past. And I would say it was actually a bad thing. I don't yeah. think that 1950s was a good thing, but, but yeah, you, you have these, Protestants, and I think the Protestants, like I'm, I'm very partial to them, in in, in a way, because I, I, I just, I really understand. I, I feel like I, I've come to really understand what it is that they were going through, and mm. and I, I think they get demonized a lot, and they're just really misunderstood. But their strategy for trying to fix a problem didn't end up working and actually kind of led to the problem that we're in right now. Whereas like the Catholics, 
it, it kind of seems to me that they were running away from the Catholics because the Catholics had developed a really like flamboyant uh, culture, like not flamboyant culture. That's not well said. What I'm trying to say is that the well, culture. Well, some of them, I wouldn't generated. know some of them, but. You know. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. yeah. Well, because if you think about it, the Catholics, they gave us some of the best art ever. It, you know, it, uh, it's some of the most beautiful architecture. Uh, it, it, they, it, Europe's culture is very intertwined with Catholicism. There's no doubting that. But yeah, I think obviously, you know, you have the, the Protestants and their reaction to to that culture kind of degenerating a little bit. But the, it's it's funny because those Protestants, they came here. And if you look at early American furniture and homes, they're, they're, it's all very simplistic. They wanted right. to rid, like they wanted to basically do the opposite of what the Catholics were doing. But, but the fascinating thing is that if you look at Catholicism today, it's still held itself together because it has the artwork, because it has the beautiful churches with all of the, you know, it, it's it's the Protestants that have completely degraded and now they're like, you know, uh, uh, pushing globalist, globalist ideas and stuff like that. And they have like rainbow flags and whatnot. It's just really fascinating that that was like, that was something that kind of kicked off our, our, our country's beginning and it was like this mm. denial of culture and oh we can't have any depictions of anything and we have to wear everything has to be plain and simple but then these people who were like you know the ones that kind of kicked off our country like it, it, they, they end up being kind of they're kind of the problem now it protestants are not in a good place i just think that's no. fascinating i mean in, in america it seems that like a lot of like people on the right wing, they're like gravitating more towards like Catholicism and orthodoxy and like the sort of, um, the, the, like the breaking up and like the subversion of like the religious right in America of like the evangelicals. Um, that like the problem I think is like, they just, they didn't have the proper like tools and even like on an aesthetic level to like actually fight the culture war. Um, they right. sort of, um, and then and let's face it, like a lot of like the ways that Protestantism developed in America, like led to a lot of like, I would say goofy and like, of course, heretical conclusions <laughs> about things, but like, yes. Oh, definitely. Yeah. And so of course, like they don't have the benefit of the sort of unity and the sort of sense of purpose, the Catholics, but then I would say like, at the same time, I'm consciously aware of like what the, you know, the, I mean, I know people like give him, I mean, I'm kind of like dividing the issue. I certainly am no fan of Bergoglio, but like, I know like Pope Francis, like he probably gets more hate than he deserves by like, you know, rad trad types or whatever. But it is true. Like the Catholic church is like in a very, not very good place <laughs> currently. For a no, variety it's of not. Issues. <laughs> yeah. Not just because of like Francis. I mean, Francis is just like in some ways, like a later development, like the, the sort of rot in the Catholic church has been going on for a very long time. And if it truly does want to be a bulwark against the current order of things, the way that certainly a lot of Orthodox churches, especially in Russia, pit themselves as being like a bulwark against what's happening now. Um, it's, but then again, like, again, this comes down to like, the problem is America will always be a Protestant nation. America will be, there will be certainly a, a pocket of Catholicism that's of course growing stronger, but this like idea that America can be turned into like some integralist, like Catholic nation, I don't think is realistic. I think like there's yeah. something with the DNA of America that is inherently Protestant. What for right, for right or wrong. Right. Like, I mean, so I'm sympathetic to, I think like, you know, my American friends who are Protestants because like America should belong to them. Honestly. I mean, maybe yeah. you should make some concessions to us Catholics, but like, let's face it. America, the founding stock of America, um, yeah, so it's it's like it obviously there's something there, but then of course like what that led to in America that's obviously like up for debate, you know. But. Yeah, well, uh, you know, if you're 
looking at the 1950s, and, and you can see there's there's no European aesthetic there. It's mm-hmm. very um, it's very simplistic, and that actually goes with the tradition of of America. Like like we've always been um, very much leaning towards simplicity, just because of what happened in Europe. The, because you know we wanted to escape that that culture um but yeah it um it, it just doesn't it doesn't end up working out because if if you basically what the protestants were doing was they wanted to get rid of all culture all art it's kind of like those those silly parents who won't let their kids watch a harry potter movie or something you know you're you're kind of putting the blindfold over your eyes or covering your ears and you're mm-hmm. you're not getting rid of the problem yeah i really do think you want to you want to give context you want to understand why something is happening and process it properly instead of just ignoring it and i kind of feel like they were they were trying to just do away with all art with all culture oh if we if we just don't invest anything into it if we just make everything super simple and bare bones we won't have this problem anymore you know do you kind of see what i'm saying and 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 that just i understand where they're coming from and and i think they're right i i do think that the the culture in europe really started to degrade you know like Marie Antoinette style kind of kind of thing it, but it, yeah just ignoring it that obviously did not work have you ever seen Robert Hughes uh I, I forget the name of the documentary but it's like it, it's it's about America. American vision yeah 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 I love that that's like one of my fa- like because Hughes is like one of my favorite art critics um I've yeah, never American. met anybody who knew about Hughes. Really? Eh? So cool. Yeah, I think that's really, really cool that that you 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 know who he is. Uh because yeah, he's a big influence on me too. If it hadn't been for him, I wouldn't have figured out a lot of what I know too. But yeah, go ahead. I'm oh no, yeah, that's great. Cause like, he was very popular at the time, but I guess like in terms of like younger people, um, like it's always nice to like share like shock of the new to people. Like they always get a kick out of it. Um, but yeah. American American Vision, I think, like was one of like his best documentaries. Like when he talks about like James Terrell, and um, you know he talks about uh, Paul Ragu and I mean a lot of pro- Paul Ragu's art is propaganda. But like mm. he talks about um, like a lot of the more conceptual things that were happening in America. It very much reminds me of Baudrillard's book, America actually it reminds me of like his analysis of like American culture being like the desert everywhere and how like everything is open on the surface to be like plundered and picked and like gone through and, and thrown away. And uh, American vision is like comprehensive. There was this really great, and he even like alluded, I think to like, the woke takeover of art where he talked about like Barbara Kruger and like this, like, you know, those posters where she had the sayings, um, like some of them are like really, uh, quite, quite hilarious. How like this crosses over from like propaganda sloganeering illustration into, um, the fine art world. Mm. So let me, let me actually look up some Barbara Kruger, um, uh, Kruger posters, yeah, uh, some of his sayings are just like incredible, like that that iconic like red and you know red and like a uh, monochrome photo. Uh, let's see. Uh, I shop, therefore I am. I, yeah, yeah. Future belongs to those who can see. Uh, we don't need another hero. Um, <laughs> the one was really good. Um, oh, of course, like gender is irrelevant. Um, money and God. Um, your your body is a battleground. That's my favorite one. Your body is a <laughs> battleground. That like is very indicative of like um, a lot of like the continental like postmodern writing on like like the body becomes a battleground. Um, let's see, unity is power, and of course it has the UN uh, globe on it. Um, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. Um, 
diversity is unity. <laughs> what? Yeah, yeah. Oh, no. Now look at Barbara no. Cougar. Um, yeah, but your body is a battleground. That's the famous one. That's the uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, so he was Hughes was dogging on this. I mean, I yeah, he was dogging on it pretty hard, like about how um, America is in the business of selling identity. Identity is everywhere, <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. And he was saying like how this like hideous, repetitious political kitsch, um, you know, <laughs> like because like. Hughes's thesis, um, as you know, is that, you know, being a great uh, critic of Warhol and, and like actually meeting Warhol and being like, you know, Hughes, that's what put him on the map, apart from like Goya and Shock of Anu, mm -hmm. was like he was like one of the first like actual critics of Warhol. And like, you know, Warhol is a very complicated figure. And I do believe he has a lot of merit. Um, yes, but, I think he does. Yeah. But I, he, I don't think he's a good artist, though. Um, well, yeah, in, yeah, but in terms of like technical, yeah. yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, sure, 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 um, <laughs> <laughs> doing the mold bug thing, um, yeah, <laughs> um, but like he was, he was saying how like Warhol was the first, um, like truly like modern art, like not modernist, but like true, like you know, after the death of the avant garde, was like the artist that turned the art world into the art business into the, you know, the yes. art market. He was the first one that like really knew how to like market himself. And he truly was a visionary in a lot of ways, but then he was just saying, well, of course, like later on in life, by the time the 1980s rolled around, um, like right before he was, uh, you know, he died, uh, early, you know, probably with complications from, from you know, the Salernus, uh, attempted, yeah. Um, Sorry, I keep forgetting we're on YouTube. <laughs> yeah, um, the attempted the attempted uh, funny business between him and uh, Valerie Salernis. Yeah. Um, so, uh, well, later on we could talk more freely because then I could just put it on Patreon. But um, you know, uh, so Warhol, like he said that later on, uh, he's like, well, Warhol, you know, developed into repetitious kitsch, and it became it became like just about the marketing of Warhol. And it became like the production, like the mass sort of um, very similar to like the philosopher Gregor Bataille, like the mass sort of like catharsis of production and waste and expenditure and how turning art into like this factory like entity um, that was in a way Warhol critiquing what America had become. And in a way doing this like very like roundabout institutional critique of like the art world itself. Being like, well, you know, if, if the art world is going to like churn out um, this much of the same, then he'll actually churn out much of the same the way yeah. that like industrial America. Um, yeah. But I wonder if Warhol were <laughs> to have like lived nowadays, like if he would have like like post, I mean, like post industrial America. I wonder like what his what he would have come up with. I'm sure he'll he would have like done something with the Internet. Oh, my tongue is tied he would have done something with the internet the way that people like um well like pipilotti or like you know any more evil version being like uh, marina abramovic uh you know like dancing around in the vr chat um but <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah sorry i'm just rambling right now i'm just rambling. oh right, uh, no yeah yeah andy warhol is um uh... like people want a dog on him and that's fine. But like you said, he, he does actually have merit. And he yeah. it's kind of hard to it's kind of hard to describe. Uh, but basically there's like a philosophical problem, set yeah. of problems that rightfully so we've kind of fallen into. And a lot of it has to do with Marcel Duchamp because of you know like language and you know a lot of art gets broken down into language and that's how you get this Barbara Kruger kind of thing. And that becomes acceptable. The, the words, the text themselves become the work of art. Yeah. yeah it's kind of funny. Like, yeah, the, the exactly. And, but, but in regards to Warhol, um, yeah, that definitely has more to do like, yeah. Like the, with the, the soup can like production yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah. So it's really interesting. It, it, the, the, these are philosophical quandaries that you kind of have to face because, for example, you know, a lot of trad type people, um, they 
they, they, they look at a painting and they're like, oh, this is great. This is a classical painting or a classical sculpture or something. But take like a sculpture as, as an example. A Grecian sculpture or Roman sculpture is irrelevant today. Yeah. Not, not in terms of like we, we we're looking back at it. And well, our collective culture and our history and like where we come from. It's very, yeah, the physiognomy. It tells us who yeah. we are. But it's a, it's perennial in that regard. Yeah, right. But but in terms of like what it was used for in the past, uh, right, the reason right. why it had it 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 was a popular thing, like to see a sculpture. Now, if you see a sculpture, it's at like an art museum or something. I, I guess what I'm saying is art goes through like technology ends up affecting if painting is relevant anymore or if a sculpture is relevant or if and why Andy Warhol made made the artwork that he made has a lot to do with, you know, yeah, philosophy and stuff like that, but also just like technology itself. You know, back in the day, a, a, a Roman sculpture was relevant because, you know, you know, a ruler would use it to to promote themselves. They, we, we don't really that that use is kind of gone. And 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 Robert Hughes talks about how paint or I think it's Robert Hughes or maybe it's a uh, Kenneth Clark. Do you like Kenneth Clark? You oh yeah. Um, he, yeah. Kenneth Kenneth Clark talks. I think it's him. He talks about how painting. It, it, movies very much replaced what painting was doing. So uh, all all I'm saying is 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 that lots of people they kind of get into into the in, into art because they realize, especially now, people are realizing how important it is. And you brought this up before. Uh, I was watching one of your uh, an interview you were in, and mm. you were talking about how uh, the battleground isn't a political one. It's 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 going to be like cultural cultural slash ar artistic. Um, uh, but 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 yeah, I, I kind of lost my point. Uh, I, I guess what I'm saying is uh, about the stat about the Roman busts and the the. Um. Yeah. yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I'm so, I'm sorry. I I kind of got lost lost in thought because there's so many there's just so many interesting things to talk about. Let me think. Yeah. Uh, what was I saying? Well, that they don't. I guess they don't speak to our own. Um, Time no, I know what I'm saying. I, All right, I, I think I know what I'm saying. I think what I'm saying. Do you know? You, that, do you think you know what you're saying? I think I know what I'm saying. I don't know though. I, I'm not sure. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> what I'm saying. I'm, sorry. I'm what just I'm, messing you with you. No, what do you mean? What do you mean? Um, <laughs> I'm having a woman moment. Uh, <laughs> okay. What I'm actually I know saying. it's hard to contain yourself. You're in the presence of such a manly gig. Oh, Chad, I know. Man. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I know that that must be the problem. That must be what's going <laughs> Wait till you put on my signature fez, then you'll really uh really I start have a question about the fez after I finally go ahead, go ahead. After I finally make my point. So so yeah, yeah. Go, going back to, to Andy Warhol. Uh I I just all that I'm saying is that. One thing that I've noticed is that people who aren't, uh, they haven't gone to art school or or haven't like dove into the philosophical aspect of things. They just they they look at they look at the state of art. And they see a banana, you know, on on like a like a canvas, like taped to a canvas, and they're like, "That's mm. dumb." But you have to understand, as retarded as it is, there is a reason why that's happening. There's a legitimate reason why there somebody is doing that. And right. Andy Warhol, it, it 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 is the case that, you know, it, yes, he's he his artwork might look really stupid to, to you, but there is a reason why Andy Warhol was making what he was making. That that being said, I don't like Andy Warhol's work. I think it's it's kind of like a one-trick pony thing. Like, mm. yes, we have this philosophical quandary we have we have we have this this little thing that he's narrowing in on and for me once once you do it one or two times and you repeat 
Marilyn Monroe over and over and over again, or the Mona Lisa, I got the point. So he did, he did burn out really fast. But yeah, my, my point is, is that I like your content and I like what you talk about because we really do have, it's, it's a very, very sophisticated problem. It's not just as simple as, oh, we just, we'll just start looking at Grecian sculptures again and start painting again, and then everything will be fine. That's not what's going on. Andy Warhol actually does have legitimacy, whether you like it or not. That's, that's all I was trying to say. Um, Yeah. And and as far as the Grecian sculptures and Roman sculptures, my, my point really just was that uh, technology shifts and, and, and paintings also like sculptures become less relevant for telling stories. And if, if, if the people in power don't really have a use for sculptures anymore or for paintings anymore because some technology has replaced them. These are all things that end up compounding into problems that we see in culture. That's, that's really all I was saying. Yeah. Yeah. I I think like, but I I think like certain aspects of sculpture and painting, especially like, especially painting me because it's like just self-serving, but like they tend to be perennial in the sense of like the, the sort of the death of, fine art or the death of painting, the death of um, different mediums. There seems to be periodically like people that come about every century or so to say, to proclaim like, you know, art is done for. Um, And in some ways I think like in terms of what people like Heidegger and Danto and even like Hegel before them, they have Mm -hmm. a point in that I think a certain mode of art reaches its crescendo. But I noticed that with painting, maybe not with sculpture, because like the barrier to entry of sculpture um, is so high. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, my my good, good friend, Fen de Villers, uh, he's like one of the I best love sculptors. Fen. Yeah, he's like probably one of the best doing it now. But he's been given the sort of gift of being able to think of space in a three dimensional way. And he's been, you know. He's been lucky to be given the opportunities he's been given. But I think like um, and, you know, I, I know of other sculptures as well. Um, my friend Michael is a good one. Uh, like there is, uh, it seems that there's always a way that like, just like painting refuses to go away. <laughs> like it, it just, it will always be there. It may be like a cultural artifact and perhaps that, I mean, I hope not, but like the rise of like digital art and the rise of like, you know, the sort of AI thing, mm. which I mean, I think is probably overblown. Um, I yeah, think oh, like, definitely yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, oh, but, I think, but, um, just one oh, yeah, thing. go ahead, go ahead. Um, uh, Fen, when you asked me earlier how we found each other, yes, it was on Twitter, but I have to, I have to thank Fen. He, he, oh. he, yeah, he actually showed me your Twitter and everything, and he was like, Hey, you need to, you need to get in contact with Geo. So, oh, nice, thanks nice. to Fen, thanks to Fen, but yeah, continue your point. Oh, you didn't see me back when I was on that uh, my previous uh, podcast. <laughs> oh, so um, <laughs> I do have a friend that, like a year and a half ago, was like, "Hey, you need this, this, you know, break the rules thing. They're they're great. Maybe you should try to get on there or something." Um. So no, I actually only started looking at everything you're, you know, related to, like the last couple weeks like month or two yeah so i just i, I just arrived I, I i don't know any of you peeps i'm just just oh, getting yeah, introduced no problem. no problem um um yeah I, i'm yeah i'm a pretty old hat among <laughs> among like the twitter audi but uh i think like i i discovered you um i think maybe around this or no a little bit before i remember i think i stumbled upon you because someone mentioned you to me Oh. And, and, uh, one of my, one of my followers mentioned you and then I started watching your videos and then, um, then someone else, another follower of mine's like, Oh, you should get, get her on the show. And then of course we started talking and, uh, yeah, the rest is history. Um, oh, cool. but do you have any more thoughts about, cause it's been an hour, all, like over an hour where I still haven't gotten to the introduction. <laughs> we did it. We did it. And we, 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 I interrupt you on on Fen, because I, w- I wanted to go back to that, because you were making a really good point. I'm sorry I interrupted. Oh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. But, but, but yeah, I, I, 
sculpture is, I, I feel like it's one of those things that, and I don't know if this is where you were going with, with, you know, the, the Fen thing. Um, it, it I, I don't know, because it's a complicated thing, like painting and sculpture, I think they'll always kind of stick around. They, they have kind of uh, like, yeah, they're, 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 they're like the original thing. Uh, people look at them and they'll always, it'll always have this kind of, uh, um, I don't know how to put it. Verve to them? Yeah. Yeah. Like, like, yeah, like in digital technology will mimic them. Like even sculpture, I'm noticing like 3d sculptures and yeah. 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 And physical things I, I think will actually become more valuable as time goes on. Like, like oh, magic yeah. cards or something, you know, they, they actually are, are something in the real world. So, so, you know, everybody's so hyped on, on, on the digital world and that's great. And I, I like NFTs, you know, I actually think NFTs are really, really interesting technologically, but there, there really is something valuable. I think people will find in the future with actually having something physical. So I'm not, yeah. I'm not saying that painting and, and sculpture are, are actually dead. Um, yeah you know, going back to your, your point about that. Um, but I don't know, it is complicated. I, well, what were you going to say, though, like, to, to finish your thought on, on that? Oh, nothing, nothing. Just that I think, like, sculpture is very particular because it requires, like, a particular set of skills and resources that I think, like, is even more elite than, like, painting or other forms of, quote-unquote, plastic arts. Um, but, of course, like, yeah. it depends what we mean by sculpture because, like, there like has been a lot of developments in terms of you know artists using different materials and found objects and and uh you know so forth uh but classical sculpture i guess what we're referring to like what fen does um that mm -hmm. will i think i think that will always capture people's attention because of the amount of like skill and intrigue that is required to produce them yes but, yeah i think so even painting i i yeah, I think yeah. people. It, yeah, there's kind of um, a uh, not. I I wouldn't. The the right word isn't gimmick. It's not a gimmick, but it kind of is in a way. Like I, I, Robert Hughes actually has a book I got recently, and I, I I can't remember the name of it, but it's about skill kind of being like a like a spectacle. It's kind of yeah like the yeah. Olympics. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Gee whiz. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So when, when, when you're able to do something like Fen uh, can do, uh, it'll always be impressive to see somebody literally chiseling away at like a block of stone or just being able to do that or, or, or paint uh, hyper realistically or whatever that, that there will always be kind of like a, yeah, an Olympian sort of, kind of thing it's like everybody's competing to show off their their skills that then, would always be impressive yeah yeah but then the downside i think is that in my opinion i think like photorealism is probably like done like as much as people talk about abstraction and and um like low low skill level stuff i think like in another way like photorealism has really it's the opposite way of destroying art in my opinion like it's me and fen talk about this quite a bit because a lot of like his fans, unfortunately, or not even like I would say his, fa his fans, but like a lot of his um, like a logs and like a lot of like people that follow him, even just to like chide him for some like weird reason. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of them, they, like they just want to like they want him to like do Arno Brecker statues of that particular regime of the Austrian painter. Um mm -hmm. You know, and they want him to do like Arno Brecker. They don't want him to like explore something that isn't like a hundred percent like a classical sculpture. And yeah, I feel he talked yeah. to me about that. Yeah. Oh, oh, you mean me? Um, yeah, well, yeah. Like, no, no, no. A Fen and I, we we had a conversation. On oh, yeah, 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 yeah. He was telling yeah, me. Sure, sure, he was, sure. Yeah, he was. He was explaining to me that he's like battling these. Tri uh, for lack of a better word, traditionalist types. And uh, I understand that, but I also understand where they're coming from. I mean, like we, we do have to like, yes, we, we have to explore 
um, different avenues in art. We we can't like close ourselves off from, uh, you know, going down these interesting avenues. But at the same time, we, we, we do have like a larger problem at hand, which is our people forgetting who we are. And so right, I think right. wanting to, what they're, what those people are alluding to, uh, obviously, are, hey, we want you to show us, you know, like represent us in the artwork that you're making. Because Fens art is, it's representational, but it's more abstract. You can't tell who the figures really are. I mean, it could be any race. It could be, you know, any, um, anybody. Yes and, and I, no, but I think it does come from a particular European consciousness, though. I think that of does. course, yeah, yeah, uh, 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 of of course. But I think the lean towards wanting to see like our physiognomy, you know. Like, oh yeah, yeah. See yeah. Us in in, I think that is actually currently a, a really important cultural thing that needs to happen because th things are going to happen in, in 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 waves and cycles like you know we're not at the point where we can just be totally expressive and not remember who we are because we still live in a world with a bunch of other people and one of one of the biggest problems that you know you know white people have or indo-european people i never know how to how, how to talk about us i never know how to address us I'll say Indo-European, I guess. Yeah, Euro yeah, European Faustian man. Yes, say, yeah. we we are losing our identity, and it's really important that going forward with the next step, we 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 remember who we are. So I I I get. I, I'm actually my last point is that I'm I'm in the, I'm in the middle. I, I don't think we should be like so rigid that we only depict things hyper realistically and in, in, in that vein. But then I also don't think we should go too abstract. Um, I, I think we, we, we should try to find a nice middle ground. You, you know what I mean? Yeah. Having done both. I mean, it's, yeah, I know what you mean. Like, I mean, I, I'm a fan of like a particular like schools of abstraction. Um, even like before the New York school, I mean the Northwestern, painters like Mark Toby, like they, they were like to them painting and the work of art was an expression of like a religiosity that they were developing. Um, like, like even, um, even like you were saying about Kandinsky and your talk with Endeavor, I think like the opposite, I think Kandinsky truly wanted to find the spiritual in the work of art. Like if you read his, um, essay, what's a book, but like, it's a long essay, like concerning the spiritual, he talks about how representation actually led to the pervasive, like materialism of the modern world because of things like, you know, French academicism and German academicism and how a lot of like what, unfortunately, like a lot of trads, like they'll worship like Bouguereau and like, you know, a lot of these, even nowadays, like these art renewal center people, a lot of that is just like the worship of skill but as That's much as true. yeah yeah and as much as they try to like revive the lessons of the old masters they only really take like a lot of these art renewal center people they'll like only take inspiration from the 19th century academic painters like Bouguereau and others um but those painters they lost they also lost the spirit of the high renaissance and even before in the old masters and like, whether it be the Flemish or us Italians or so forth, yeah. like they also lost that spirit. So now what you have is like, you have this sort of LARPing a very like confined area of academic skill in painting that robs it of his essence. So then Kandinsky, he has this like very elaborate system of abstraction that denotes different senses having to relate to color and to the line and to form and how that expresses the essence of things. But then of course, I mean, the other opposite would be like what you and like more traditional people like, you know, like trad Western art, what you critique in terms of like that led to the decadence of the modern art movements later on. Um, but I like, I mean, I know I'm biased because I started off with like appreciating things like abstraction, but then it's sort of like I understand the limitations to that as well, because after a certain point, 
it's very easy to parody both. It's very easy to yeah. like, become a hyper realist. And no, it's not easy to become hyper realist, but it's like very easy to like parody if you're given the technical skill and you treat it like an artist and craft rather than the work of art. It's very easy to like fall into the same traps that the academic painters did. But then on the other side of that, it's also very easy to create like nonsense and like what we know. Like yeah. I know people like they hate like people hate like Saitambi, but I think like Saitambi like he's a pretty good, he has a pretty good sense of color and form, but you know, people, they, unfortunately they'll just like look at the, um, and it's really because of Paul Joseph Watson that did this. Like they'll, they'll look at the, um, the red circles that he did and they're like, Oh, that's terrible. But like, <laughs> that was part of like a whole series, but yeah. So I understand well, like, yeah, yeah. I'm just well, rambling. Really. No, no. Well, what, what, everything you said, um, I, I, I agree. I, I think we're kind of the point that we're kind of at is we're trying to figure out where we're going to go next. Yeah. I, I, I feel like the problem is just because an artist like Kandinsky, you know, might've gotten some of the, some of the things he was aiming, some of the things that he was aiming at, he ended up doing well. Um, obviously doesn't mean that everything he he did was was correct and vice versa uh and and I, I don't think everybody's in on you know destroying art or or you know is um some people and reasonably so think that pollock actually uh was paid by the american government to make the artwork that he did oh yeah the cia thing yeah yeah because yeah, because well, one one thing you do have to consider is a lot of these people could be useful idiots um, or they could actually be, you know, um, paid by the government to make the artwork that they're making or the movies that they're making. All I'm saying is that the subversion is definitely an element that people, when they're looking at the art, when you're looking at the art world, you also have to consider or movies that uh, somebody like Kandinsky or, you know, even a Tarantino they 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 slip through the gate, or they they're allowed to um, um, be published or whatever, or mo had to have their movie seen because they fulfill a certain agenda. Yeah, Hollywood's much more obvious. I think like because yes. there actually was like an attempt to subvert Hollywood through Mockingbird and through other programs. Like Hollywood's obviously right. like, but when it comes to Pollock and like the CIA money thing, I think like. In the one sense, it's true. Of course, nowadays, I mean, if you look at the artwork that's being promoted by the Glowies, I mean, obviously a lot of it is like this weird return to representation, but for the mm. benefit of like subverting things like the human body and this sort of European phenotype. But, yes. but like, you know, that's why like this whole turn recently in the contemporary art world of new figuration or what would they call it? Yeah, new figuration. Like that's why I don't believe it's inherently like a, a good thing because it's like, you know, look at the woke artists that are doing it. They're doing it to, to pick, quote unquote, unconventional bodies, which I mean, I think like, and again, I think when we talk about Jenny, excuse me, um, when we talk about, <laughs> damn, uh, we talk about Jenny Savile, right? I can't even, can't even announce the words. Um, I think like what she's doing in, in a sense is important. And I think like when it comes to, like, of course, I think like representation, a lot of it's a scam and that like, one-to-one -one representation of identity is sort of like in one sense i agree that it's somewhat important but it's not as important as like you know you have to have like a margin of representation like turning representation in either the work of art or in entertainment into like or culture in general into this quantifiable thing is like ridiculous um well it just depends on what your what your aim is as like a yeah, yeah. like you know i think that that's one i i, I think that's a part of the, this this bigger problem uh what what direction do we go in it's hard to say because you know yes it, it, it seems obvious that oh the classical stuff is really great okay well now you're discounting all of all of the stuff that that is experimental and is actually quite spiritual possibly but then you also have this issue of like you have to look at things historically and like who's in control and what yeah. the, the messages they want to push so uh, all these things considered, I think we're all pretty lost. 
Um, and yeah. you know, when you're looking at art and you're trying to process whether or not something is good or if that's the correct direction, you can't just look at it purely within like the perspective of, you know, the, the taste that you have and you, you have to consider history and all that stuff and like who's in control to decide, okay, is this just subversion and it's actually crap or was it actually um, maybe doing both? It was subversion, but it also had some good elements. It's, yeah. it's really hard. It's a hard balance. Um, but yeah, I just want people to keep that in mind because when you're looking at markets, you know, like people, lots of people think, oh, you know, like a libertarian type. Oh, this is exactly how the market's going to work. I, I I forget. It's like Keynesian economics or or whatever. They they or is it is it Keynesian? No, Keynes no. That's that's like that's like liberal. Um, What's libertarian the libertarian is a uh, Rothbard or uh, Mises or uh, Austrian school. Austrian. Austrian. There. Yeah. Yes, the Austrian school. They they think everything. It's more like organic. Like there's there's a. Yeah, Friedrich um, Hayek, and yeah, yeah, and it's not like that. <laughs> things are things are manipulated. And the desire is created artificially all the time. Desire is is the the mechanism by which, I mean, I know this like a Deleuzian point, but like you know, desire really is like an abstract machine that produces or channels different like wants and different energies in that go into the economy. Um, yeah, right. Yeah. Well, yeah. So so. It, the, it, it honestly this the same goes for art in my opinion or music or whatever things in culture it's we can't we have to remember that there's manipulation and you don't want to be like an austrian you know um uh, perspective you know like li like libertarian type where you think that the free market oh if it's a, if it's a good idea the free market of ideas or whatever that's you're not taking into account that there is manipulation, that people will try to subvert you. They will try to lie to you. They will form groups. And then th that's all I'm saying. So it's a complicated problem. Uh, it, it, but it's one, it, that particular issue, I think is one that like people don't want to face. Don't you mm. agree? Like people don't, they don't like the idea that someone has reached in you know, and, and, and like they're, they've manipulated and fooled everybody. But I think because if you look at the, the Frankfurt School, can I mention them? Yeah. Frankfurt School um, or Bauhaus. They were not like, yes, maybe the, the useful idiots that were making some good art were actually genuinely trying to to make something. But like it, they the people at the helm, they were not. They, they 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 were not doing it for pure their their intentions were not pure in my opinion they're yeah they, yeah they're, they're yeah because what well whatever, i mean go ahead sorry go ahead well, well <laughs> I, I guess i guess my last point is um uh, i can't remember who it was i wish i could remember the quote and i i think i tried to bring this up to endeavor uh maybe with the kandinsky thing i can't remember but anyhow one of the the things that was noted in the fall of of um, uh, Russia into communism was mm. that fashion was one of the first things to go. It, basically, meaning like yeah, you know, all all of the Russian like fashion and high art, like a lot of the Russian cosmicists and the Silver Lake and like other experimental art forms, they were like, yeah, they're the first to go. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah. They're yeah. the first to go, and 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 that's you know one of the reasons why I think you're right. It's it's not politics; it's it's culture that you kind of have to start from. And the, and the people who are currently in power, and and the way that they subverted us all, uh, I really do think it's it, they started with the art, they started with the culture, with fashion and stuff like that. And so. Um, you, you just, all I'm saying is you you can't discount that that's that's happening, you know. Uh, and if you look back at the even in Russia, not just in Germany, you see it's the same type of people. They 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 always have um they always go about subverting us and and destroying our country through culture in in basically the same exact way. 
It, it's yeah. actually remarkable. Yeah, the Amish. Um, anyways, the, uh, yes, no, the Irish. Hello. Yeah, the the potato, the eternal potato. Um, so <laughs> there. Um, no, I think like um, th like okay, I I'm. What was I getting at? Oh yeah, so my original point was about the CIA thing is that, like, for a period, I mean, of course that was true. Like that these modern artists were getting like you know a cut, but I think like that was a brief program, and that really was like taking along like it was taken up in a lot of different um trends that the, that the glowies were studying in the 50s and 60s mm -hmm. and, and culture and i think like it's like subversion is very like funny in in the sense that you don't have to directly be paid off like in other words like you don't have to like be a glowy to do the bidding of the glowies it's just mm -hmm. that along the way certain people have a certain way of thinking like Yes. I think the problem with a lot of like trad, like trad people or a lot of like people on the right is that they will look at the CIA thing and they'll look at the the New York the New York school but they don't like recognize that these artists were responding to previous developments within the work of art in the in the 19th and 20th centuries that d made them develop into what they developed into start even in America starting as early as like Urshal Gorky um, in terms of like the Frankfurt stuff, I mean, I'm very, I'm kind of like very critical of like the Frankfurt stuff because I feel like it displaces a lot of the blame on like actual like liberal thinking that came from the Enlightenment. So like the sort of like intellectual dork web thesis of people like James Lindsay that like, oh, these like cultural Marxists subverting and really it's like, you know, our precious Enlightenment liberalism isn't at fault. But also I think like, with certain art, with certain thinkers, you could probably make that argument, especially like Marcuse. Even though I do think that, as much as I disagree with his particular that essay and the work of art, like I think that there is an element to a lot of art that is be that essentially becomes escapism. But I mean, Marcuse is a mixed bag because One Dimensional Man is pretty good. Um, his whole like you know eros and civilization, the free love stuff, obviously like is when people think. Here's the thing. When people talk about the Frankfurt School, they mean Herbert Marcuse. That's what they mean. Um, mm -hmm. If you like, you know, if you look at, for example, Theodore Adorno, I mean, he comes off as like a trad. If you actually like read his writings on the work of art, like he very much has like the curmudgeon trad. Um, you know, that's why people like nowadays, I think, well, I mean, I know he's he's memed on because like people like the Red Scare people love him so much. But like, you know, writers like Christopher Lash, um, and even like to an extent, Roger Scruton, like they have very like similar ways of thinking to someone like Theodore Adorno and his partner, uh, is intellectual. He wrote the dialectic of enlightenment with, uh, Horkheimer, but then oh. when you, yeah, but then of course, like there is problematic things there too, because he wrote like, uh, what was that book? Um, he developed like the same thinking as people like Wilhelm Reich, the, uh, mass call the authoritarian personality. Yeah, because mm -hmm. Wilhelm Reich wrote the the fascist, uh, what's it called? Um, the fascist personality, the fascist, uh, whatever. But he wrote the authoritarian personality, which is like, again, like that just exposes his Marxism. But I think well, that when, yeah, I mean, when well, it comes to his other books, like aesthetic theory and the dialect of enlightenment. Oh, sorry, go ahead. So, go well, there's, ahead. A, there's no, there's, it, it, well, like I said originally, uh, I, do, I don't think that it's fair to just look at look at it all and say it's all subversion but I, I i guess i'm just i'm just saying you kind of you have to take a balanced approach because a lot of these people that you're talking about i i, yeah, I don't they were very don't, subversive yeah it's it's true it's true they they, they, um, they do have an interest that is not european and uh and they're um one of the things that, that that you'll obviously notice is that all of these people are taking part in in just breaking everything down, you know. Uh, it, well, yeah, even Adorno with negative dialectics, that's big. It, yeah, yeah, it's it's yeah, it, and, and when when you're just, I, I guess it's kind of the mo motivation behind it that you have to ask yourself why is somebody doing what they're doing. In the case of like Andy Warhol, just to pick a random artist. He, he, I think he's, 
he doesn't really understand things on a level that like, you know, the person who's allowing him to show his art. Uh, might. Yeah, you may not understand as much as Peggy Guggen- Guggenheim in other words. Yeah. 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 There, Cause, cause I feel like the, the, you know, the, the producer of the film or whatever will let uh, this director do their thing. And that, that director may not, uh, may have genuine intentions, whether it be to just get famous or to, to actually make a good piece of artwork or whatever. But the real people who, who are actually in control are, and are like the filter are, are, are the producers or, or the people who own the gallery or whatever, or, or the art school director or whatever. Right. Um, right, right. Those people I've just noticed not so much the artist. I think the artist, they, they might just be a useful idiot, you know, or might not really know who they're speaking for. Uh, they're just kind of going with the trend and that's an organic thing. But I've just noticed that there's kind of like this uh, connection between all of these people who are kind of more in positions of power over these artists that definitely have like their aim is more towards breaking things down than actually like contributing in like a meaningful way. Like they obviously yeah. have some sort of agenda that, that, or, or, or they have a disdain for the native people. Like, like they don't like Americans or they don't like European culture and their aim is clearly to destroy it. It'll, like I said, maybe, maybe out of, out of some, maybe, maybe they're a part of some organization or something, but I, I think it could just be, a, a hatred or something like they do. I don't, I'm, I'm saying that they're not entirely genuine in what they're mm. doing. And that's obviously very, I, I, that's just what I've noticed, but you do make good points. I'm, I'm not saying that they don't like have valuable things to say, or they yeah. may have been right about certain things, but I think in general, whatever it is that they're doing and what they're pushing and they are, they are enlightenment ideas Obviously, the Enlightenment is a really big issue. Mm-hmm. It, I, I would just say that the, the direction that, that all these people were pushing us in, were, it was definitely not, not good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's sure, no question. Sure. No question well, about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, no, it, it is true. I mean, like, I mean, I get a lot of heat because, like, a lot of my grad work was around Michel Foucault. And I think, like, he's very um, misunderstood. But at the same time, I mean, the, the sort of like the sort of fruits that certain thinkers produce, of course, has been to the detriment, um, especially when their acolytes like take them and run with them in a variety mm-hmm. of ways. But I mean, well, I mean, I mentioned Jenny, Jenny Savile and uh, I think like she is an cr- incredibly skilled artist and she is like someone who takes um, a more academic approach to portraiture and is able to sort of, mix abstraction with the portrait which is very difficult to pull off effectively definitely yeah and you know and i think like a lot of her more larger works um has been important and i do think i do sense that in terms of representation like i do understand that the vast majority of the sort of common uh, woman body types at a certain age um, has been sort of absent in the work of art. And it's funny, like I read this article um, that she wrote or she was being interviewed in The Guardian where she talks about after she had a kid, how that like changed her perspective on things and how like the sort of like radicalism of her youth sort of like tapered off and how like this relation to the woman's body after you have a child as opposed to like what most media depicts as like the fertile young, well, not even fertile nowadays, but like, cause nowadays like fertility is becoming like the site of, you know, derision. Like now it's the, now it's the same like marketability of the young woman, but that young woman is inherently sterile because now it becomes like the girl boss. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's inverted. Yeah. So I understand like in her work of art, like the need to express the sort of, the sort of like, with warts and all the the reality of the female body but then along the way of course when you hear her speak i mean of course she's not like uh i mean she's going along with like the cultural like milieu and uh you know it's it's yeah it's not very no, i see, I see what and you're some saying. of her works are very subversive let's face it like very like 
especially when it comes to like her depictions of of sexuality among um different well i mean how much can i mention the racial thing uh, but like you know yeah. um uh, you know like <laughs> there's an element there that is like i understand like when people talk about she's either celebrating the grotesqueness of the woman's body but i don't hate her yeah I, yeah I don't I don't I'm I'm craw I'm at the crossroads. She's she she's a really interesting case because like like you mentioned she kind of fits she she she's actually in a really interesting place because she's technically gifted but then yeah. she's got the grotesque element down but then she also has like a good message that she's kind of sending in in a way um, yeah. Um, yeah. she's she is it is good commentary um so she's a really hard one yeah to but uh, then she does devolve into like shit liberty though like it's well yeah well that's that's the thing about that that um 90s or late 80s uh lucy and freud that whole like era of of artists is again it's kind of like what happened to grunge music uh you you kind of it grunge is interesting because you you have the the 80s and well, there's different modes metal. of grunge too. That's also very interesting. But well, well, like grunge and 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 you know, P.T. Anderson films or or like like that whole era and and you know with 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 that era of painting, it's it's all very much. I kind of feel like slice of life in a way, like mm, a gritty yeah. slice of life. Uh, where the '80s was a was a massive party and uh, a bunch of. Um, hair metal people uh, died because they drank too much alcohol and did co- drugs and stuff. Mm-hmm. And uh, and now we're kind of, we're all, it's kind of like the bad after party. I don't know if, if I'm explaining this well, but a lot of, a lot of that, you know, and you'll notice that like painting in particular, it, now, now, now Jenny Seville is not even, she's not even like in the club anymore. Like she's, yeah. Yeah. And that now it's Kahindi Wildly. You know, do you know who Kahindi Wildly oh, is? Oh yeah. Oh god. Ooh, 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 ooh. <laughs> Kahindi I, Wildly I, I, is the extension not, of it. Yeah, that's, yeah. That's where everything is. So, I mean, here it, in it, Canada we have uh, what's his name, Mockman, uh which uh don't 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 look up a lot of his paintings and do some. Although his Trudeau oh. one was pretty based. That was pretty based where Trudeau is getting his cheeks busted by uh <laughs> some uh, indigenous people but well, uh that sounds <laughs> that does sound kind of base but candy wildly is definitely not not base and and that that's kind of where painting ha- and, and and even like music it, it again it's funny how they 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 definitely all are kind of doing the same thing we're we've been we well the obama from- era was like a cultural dead zone in a lot of ways like a lot like the 2010s that like when Kenya Wiley like rose to prominence because of that Obama portrait, like yeah, it, 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 the culture was not doing very well in, at the time. Like, I mean, it seems like, well, I mean, if you really wanted to go down the road of like, why a certain strain of American culture is being worshipped that Kenya Wiley represents, I mean, you know, obviously, but like, I, but, but what was your point? Sorry. I, well, I cut no, you no, no, that's fine. It, it's uh, what, my point is is that um it's it's interesting because like the the 70s and the and the 80s like that like that's kind of like peak party for like everything like everybody like paint the painting world the movies music everything and then and then after that you get a sort of like grungy like like um slice of life we're all depressed and then after that and it's kind of like the death of everything uh, that then you know you don't have rock music anymore. Then the late nineties comes, and then you have like "We Are the World," like end of history. Uh, yeah, right. And then right after that, what do you World get? World music, you, get, you know, you revival Kahindi of the new Wally, age movement. You get yeah. rap music, and 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 suddenly, rock music isn't cool anymore. And 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 if you want to be a painter, well, oh, the only way you can be a painter is if you're if you're if you're black. And you have other people paint your painting for you. Oh, and if you if you're a white artist, 
well, you better be like Damien Hurst and it's all found objects and it's like formaldehyde, you know, cow or whatever. So I, I just, I think it's fascinating how everything kind of took that like, like course, like, like now even, even, you know, uh, Jenny Seville, she's not even, she's not relevant anymore. Uh, yeah. I and- think having a kid ruined her in terms of like marketability. Cause that's like, Ooh, Oh no, Possibly. she's an actual woman. Yeah. Not, not <laughs> feminist. Yeah. But yeah, if you want to be a painter today, you have to be and you can't put, you can't actually, it has to be a parody basically. We're, we're, and look at, look at music too. Like music we've been for the last like 25 years, it's been rap music. Think about that. You know, rock music is dead. Nothing with skill. Uh, it's um, anything European related, anything having to do, it, it's it's just gone. So I, I think painting is well, dead. Came but... with, that came with the Americanization of all culture. Um, and I think like that's a big problem, probably a big vector of like why that is. Um, although not to say like there are a lot of skilled rap artists, like there is a lot of skilled hip hop or hip hop artists, but I, yeah, I, Kendrick I, Lamar. Yeah. He's really good. Well, but, yeah, but he's like, oh man, <laughs> he's oh Oh man. His recent album was such a nose dive in was terms it? of like, well, in terms of like the lyrics and like basically like playing to like the sensibilities of like a lot of these like urban white liberals that listen to Chapo Trap House that also listen to Kendrick Lamar because like Uh listening to rap music is like a sort it's like to like the white irony cell leftist it seems like African-American culture is like the source of authenticity for them yes it's like it's like what Adorno would call the cult of authenticity ironically enough like it's (laughs) he like writes about like the um lyrics about like the sacrament if you know what I mean, of the last two years, Mm -hmm. Um, like also like a bunch of like other like in vogue culture war stuff, which is very, which I mean, yeah. Yeah. I mean, a lot of like the old school rappers were pretty, pretty, pretty good. Um, But yeah, I know what you mean though. It is because I think like America being the vector of global culture, I mean, for now is the vector of global culture um, that really, um, a lot of like what developed in America, especially like this anxiety around race and around the racial makeup of America and the way that it's expressed in the work of art, that becomes like, I, like one of the most hilarious things I've ever heard was um, me and me and Matthew, we were doing this episode on the symbolists and we mentioned Kara Walker and for research, we ended up, we stumbled upon before, um, I don't know if you could find this, maybe you could find this in Odyssey, but this was before um, American Renaissance, before their YouTube channel got yeeted, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, it was Jared Taylor reviewing Kara Walker's sugar baby statue of like the, the mammy. Oh, I've, seen, I've seen that one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And the, But the <laughs> most hilarious part was just like Jared Taylor reviewing Carol Walker and like, of course, bringing up how like, you know, Carol Walker has this like weird fetishization of like her own race. And, you know, she married like two white dudes and like, it's all about like in, in like the, you know, antebellum South with that, you know, particular thing that happened with African-Americans and how Mm -hmm. like the white massa and the, well, you know, I don't have to explain it. Um, Yeah. Like, it's funny, like, Jared Taylor was talking about, like, that, but she, he's like, when you look at this painting, you look at the vivacious buttocks of the sugar baby. <laughs> it's like, oh, my God, I, I lost it right there. The vivacious buttocks, like, in his, like, it is, like, you know, Atlantic accent, yeah. <laughs> like, old school wasp accent. Um, <laughs> but, oh, man. But it's did, true, yeah. like, I mean, Kier Walker is, like, a good artist, but like she's even critiqued. no, she is not. Well, I mean, Geo, you're uh, just try- you're just trying to be you're just <laughs> trying to be edgy. Oh, no, I'm trying just- to be nice, but I guess yeah, edgy. No, guess, she but. is not. She she is a very good say, fetish artist. Wait, what'd she's you say? She's a very what? good fetish artist. <laughs> 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 what, what, okay. what did you say? I can agree I- with that. And not the best, but. 
<laughs> there are other woke artists that critique her that say that like what she's doing is like explicitly it doesn't matter because they're well, gonna criticize yeah. everything under the sun i think a lot of it's probably like professional resentment that like why did carol walker get picked to be like like kenda wiley or like sanford biggers like why did they get to be picked to represent like african-american art in america like it's i think like there's a resentment there but they do critique her that like she's doing a disservice to black people in america because of her like inherently fetishistic nature to like why she depicts a lot of racial and well, historic issues in America. A lot, people, <laughs> a lot of these people who inhabit these spaces, you have to realize they they love they um they're moral busybodies anyhow. Yeah. Oh yeah. So they're they're gonna be like the like like the vegan crowd or something. You know, the, the, you don't wanna you don't want to get involved with those people because yeah. then you'll turn into Nikocado Nick, Avocado. If you know who yeah. that is. <laughs> I, I have this great tweet. It's funny because uh, uh, my my good friend Peter Nemitz, uh, he uh, he had this tweet about Nikocado Avocado about being like the perfect representation of like the American century. But I had this tweet. He is. You know, yeah. I have this he tweet really is. He, yeah, uh, Nikocado yeah. avocado. I just recently. I mean, as a fat man myself, I gotta say what he's doing is terrible. But like, uh, it's yeah, it's, it, not it's a good raw. Thing. It's the best form of art. This is yeah, this yeah, is art at its best. Yeah. Like mukbang, yeah. like it, it's total like, it's genius. It is, isn't it? it isn't I had this cause... great tweet. I had this great tweet where I said that um, Nick, in terms of performance art. Nikocado avocado is the absolute inverse, is the polar opposite of Kafka as the hunger artist who starves himself <laughs> to achieve greatness, but on an absurdist oh level. Because what did the hunger artist say at the end when the boy discovered him in the cage because he was a carnival sideshow attraction? Um, and every time the carnival would come to town, he would like go longer, he would starve himself longer, his fast would be, you know, infinite, right? Mm hmm. His last, you know, dying breath, he says to the boy, oh, I, I just, a total nonsense, like, piss off answer that leaves, leads to, like, the Kafkaesque absurdism of the moment. Uh, he said, well, there was nothing good to eat. I didn't find anything good to eat. Oh. And, and that was like, and then I remember being in, in, in class and, like, we were racking our brains over this, right? Um, why he would do this. But Nikocado Avakal was the opposite. He like, why did you do this to yourself? Because everything was good to eat. Like, uh, you know, <laughs> the absurdism of why he's doing this, why he's destroying his body. Because here's the thing you want to know something about fat people. Okay. Um, as a fat myself, although I'm trying to change, I'm trying to change. Um, but this isn't about being fat. This no, no, no. It's not. Avocado is about something like mental illness. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. Well, well, he had a run in with vegans. He, yes, he, yes, yeah, yeah. They made him go crazy. And then, I think that's a part of the reason why he ended up doing what he what he does. Yeah. yeah. Have you seen that video where he's like, "I'm tr I'm trying to be vegan, but all the vegans they're just so crazy." And but but aside aside from that, and and then I'll let you finish your point. Uh, he also is like, you could say this is the worst possible content. You could say, "Oh, this is like." pinnacle degeneracy but yeah. but but is it maybe it's actually furthering things because isn't he kind of living in reality like yeah the, like people who are being fake and they're like pretending that everything is okay he's like a clown he's like exactly clown he's a gesture food. of god <laughs> yes yeah. exactly so <laughs> it's the ridiculous it's so it's funny when you look at it like that it really is. But yeah, what, what, what were you going to say? I was going to say, um, now that I've reached my uh, Patreon goal, I have to write my book on art and aesthetics, a collection of essays, and I'll probably like write about um, humans of flat design and uh, and what I call neoliberal mm. catch. But when it comes, okay, here's the thing. Here's the here's the fat pill. Um, <laughs> when you when you have when you're predisposed to being of a heavier set, nowadays there's probably some like really weird um like chemicals in the food and water type stuff going on uh seed oils or what have you because usually when it comes to the physiognomy of fat people um when you develop as a fat person 
you like have your body um it used to be that it would naturally um portion out different uh, uh you know your legs are heavier and they're thicker your muscle mm. mass is obviously probably greater than a normal skinny person uh that's why fat people when they do slim down they have more muscle mass um but nowadays with all of like i truly believe with all of the food chemicals in the food and water a lot of like even men which is unheard of developing what they call cushing syndrome where it's like your body like your visceral fat is large but your legs are still skinny and like like a normal person's legs and you have yeah. like a lot of disproportionate features like that's terrible right like i like i'm pretty like you know being the fat kid my whole life like i pretty much have like very thick legs and, and hips and so forth right like with nick Okado avocado what, the reason i bring this up is because he's talking about how he can't breathe normally he all of a sudden develops sleep apnea he's got a crushed Ooh. rib uh he has like walking problems why he needs like the little Randall cart. Mm -hmm. It's because when you gain weight, when you, okay. When you don't grow up as a fat person, when you like gain a massive amount of weight, all of a sudden, like he did, your body is like screaming. Your body is like not going to cope. And the thing is like, when you're fat for a long time, eventually it does catch up to you. Obviously like, yeah. you know, now that I'm going to be like 30 this year, like I'm trying to like, for the past two years, I've been trying to, you know, trying to lose weight um but it's like uh your body eventually will catch up but when you um when you have a sudden spike in weight in weight gain that is terrible that's like not healthy at all that's why he's developing that's a shock yeah that's a shock, shock. To your body. yeah that's why i think it's almost like a performance art thing because he has the tools and he has the physiognomy to like lose a lot of weight probably like he's you know developing being like historically a skinny person his whole life he can lose like he, if he tried he could lose a, a good amount of weight in a short period of time but why is he doing this it either could be a conscious performance or it could be a combination of that with very very disturbed relationship to his own mental health his own sexuality and so forth. he makes like, a lot of money too and he makes a lot of money that's and he gets a lot of attention yeah, that's probably the worst part of it is that he gets money and attention because of what he's doing to himself. I think it's fantastic. I love it. I, I it's love it. I love it because level. yeah, it's next. I want. Level. I think people need to be like he's showing us how ugly everything is. Not intentionally. Like maybe it's right. intentional, but it's it's um. I think it, it, it hastens things. It like, like speeds oh, yeah. up the process. It accelerates you know, the process. Do you know what yeah, I mean? It it. <laughs> <laughs> no, keep doing what you're doing. Nikocado avocado. <laughs> a lot of Germans live in Brazil. A lot of Italians. Yeah. I think like apart from America, like um, the country with the most Italian diaspora is in Brazil. Um, yeah. Mm, gotcha. Yeah. No, Same. I mean, Argentina too. Like Argentina. European You'd be surprised. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I've actually, um, I've known people who, even in Mexico, uh, they, they, you know, there's this town. I can't remember what it's called, but uh, it's, it's, it's gorgeous, and it's like up on like a mountaintop, and it's, it's, it, they're Mexican people, but they're European Mexican, and yeah. they have like blonde hair and blue eyes, and, and they're, uh, they're there's Christmas. definitely. Yeah, yeah, there's a there's a difference uh you know uh between like the more like native uh mixed uh uh Mexican people. They, they like, literally like, look like the white girl edit of AOC. Do you ever yeah. see, see you see yes, that? Yes, I've seen that. Oh yes. Blonde hair. <laughs> <laughs> a little too graphic. Uh yeah. that one up. That one yeah. Up. Yeah, oh, they, 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 yeah, they yeah, they um it that's that's interesting. I didn't know that there were so many Italians in Brazil. Yeah, well, even Argentina, especially like they have Argentina is basically like a European country almost. Like uh, my good friend, you'd like a real you like her a lot. Do you know Lady Aster on Twitter? Hmm. Lady of the Lake on Twitter. Yeah, she's you'd really like her. Her she's her aesthetic posting, but uh, okay. she she's Argentinian, but she's the same. Like she's ethnically Italian, um, and like. Uh, yeah, she's a really great poster. You'd like her. She was the only woman to be featured on Caribbean Rhythms by Bronze Age Pervert. So 
That is how based she is. The <laughs> only woman, the only biological woman to actually be on Bronze Age Mind, Bronze Age po- Perverts podcast. So, um, Bronze she, Age Pervert podcast. Yeah, you know Caribbean rhythms. No, like I said, I'm new. I'm I'm so new to this. You don't know about Bronze Age Pervert. No, have you read I, Bronze Age Mindset? I have not. Oh my god. Oh well, I mean, I don't know. It's not. It's not for the ladies, but you know. <laughs> oh, trust me, I, I'm fine. I, you don't. I, you seriously don't know about BAP? No. Oh my god. I'm curious, oh. you, you can. I mean, send it my way. Um. It's 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 complicated. It's complicated, but I think why is it complicated? you'd like you'd like BAP. You'd like BAP. I think. Um. I uh, I am not. Um. Like I said, I like I like hang out on 4chan, so. So I'm, I'm fine. I want to, okay, finally, let's get to it. But I okay. did want to <laughs> talk a bit more about Jenny Savage. It's been two hours. Uh, you like sort of, in my estimation, maybe it's just my perception, but like you came out of nowhere a little bit. Like wh- what is your origin story? What led you to this place? Um, <laughs> I'm calling you Gifts. I don't know if you want to use your real name. It's cool if you don't want to use your name. I'll just, we'll just do Gifts for now. I'm still deciding. All right. All right. Yeah. That's cool. Um, um, how old are you, by the way? You don't, mind, you don't want to reveal that. It's, it's, I don't want to not, reveal it. I'll tell you in private, though. All right. Older, but older millennial or younger millennial or Zoomer? You don't strike um, me as a Zoomer. I don't know. It would, what do I strike you as? Probably like same as me, like millennial. Yeah. <laughs> millennial? Yeah. Yes. You're millennial? <laughs> yeah, it is 30 the, the cutoff. So you're yeah, I'm considered. Now. Yeah, I'm considered like core to younger millennial. I would say, I'll say I'm in your range. Yeah, all right. There you go. I'm in yeah. your range. Uh, yeah, because I think you do have like a millennial sensibility, which I wanted to talk about. Um, so what is your origin story? Like, how did you get it? Like, how did you start producing music and videos? But also, like, I guess, like, what is your relationship to the Internet in general? And like, why did you start posting? And what led you to like, here, whatever here is, right? This thing. <laughs> yeah, what, what, where are we exactly? Uh, yeah yeah this thing of ours as we like to call it um, yeah. yeah the well i i liked like i'm writing this article series i don't know if you heard but like i have to get back to it actually but I just you know ever since i broke off btr and i've been doing my own thing like it's mm-hmm. i've been busy all the time um but i've been trying to write this article series on what i term the e-right the internet right wing and my first one is up on substack uh, but yeah, like I just, that's generally what I call it. Um, I know people like to use different terms like dissident, right? Like I know people don't like that term. The intellectual um, dark web. Yeah. Well, that's something, <laughs> something that's entirely so, different, so but stupid. yeah, it's a, I, I know like, because that vanity fair article that came out a month ago, like people like the new right was like the, the term that they were using, <laughs> um, which I think is stupid. And like Wait, a lot, so what do you what do you... I call it the E right, the the internet right wing, the okay. E right, yeah, you know E like online. It's, it's yeah. definitely not all right. I've had people, I've had people that are like more normy, like they're like yeah, yeah, yeah. This yeah, yeah. Like, oh, this is like the all right, and it's like that is, it's definitely not the all right. Like the all right is, it's like, it's, yeah, it's a, it's no longer a force, but I mean, I would say it, certain all right like ideas, thing. but but anyhow, but to go back to um. Uh, the the original thing where we're at is what do, what do you call it? What would you call this space? Uh, the e right, the e right. Okay, yeah, the e right. Which so, I mean does incorporate like some of the older like alt right people that are still around. Like I mean, yeah, for sure. But a lot of these young men, they're they actually need to to work with women and have a good personality and be you know, have a positive yeah. mindset to attract somebody because they don't, they have a different set of cards to their hands. You see what I mean? It's just like really damaging what he's, what he's doing to a certain extent. Like yeah, for exactly. the men. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, I, I think like, um, uh, well, well, me and me and my friend, Catherine, we talk about this all the time, the writer, uh, default friend, uh, what about like the incel question and the, mm. the fem cell and all that. I think like it, it is true. I think we're in a level, we're in a state of crisis, I think, in Western civilization when it comes to relations between men and women. And I feel like on the one end, I mean, it's true that 
there needs to be an acceptance of like at least a casual, not like outright hatred, but like a casual cr criticism of like the sort of whatever you want to call it, like gynocratic uh, order that we live in. And like sort of like the mode of discourse being heavily favored towards women yeah. in, all, in all areas of life. But at the same time, like when it crosses over into like unironic woman hatred, it's like that is like um, it's not like the typical like libtard like, oh, well, they're going to go and become like Alex Masarian or whatever. Like it's more of like it's just it's bad for the soul, I feel. Um, it's, it's bad it's, for the soul. That's yeah, it's exactly bad for the male it. soul, in other words. Yeah. There's 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 a point at which like being an irony bro like it, whatever like you go too far and then it actually it is actually detrimental to you and yeah that's the point is i, I feel like we're, we're at the point where it's actually just it, it's it's hurting everybody to have that mindset because it, it's good to break things down and critique things but now they're just like becoming the meme almost it yeah it's like it's it's gone so far with um erasing any aspect of the feminine that it pulls towards its antecedent yeah it's true well, uh, well and Gia, wouldn't you say in a lot of ways that the the female like let's see how can i well okay what it, th this is kind of a more um this is my take on things all right when, when i look at what happened with the catholics with the catholic church in europe you go into this in my opinion, a, a more like it's like a golden age where you have um, the more beautiful aspects of European culture that people kind of like fawn over now today. Right, right, right. And they all happen, you know, it's it's sh during the time of chivalry, and chivalry is uh, very misunderstood. I feel like most people don't really know what it is. I'm yeah, even the term patriarchy is misunderstood. Yeah, and patriot, yeah, and so so chivalry was a really good thing for women. Kenneth Clark actually has a really good segment in his documentary Civilization where he talks about this, that in originally, and you can look at the artwork, the way that they depicted women, like more Viking-esque, like the women were basically just, it was a, it was a, a, a body thing, you know, like, like right, the, right. physical, like they have the children, stuff like that. It's very sexualized. But then at, after chivalry or during chivalry, and now, of course, chivalry is like starting to, to fade out um, in, our, in, in our current time. But, but basically, um, it, women, it, there was a shift from women being these physical objects sexualized to being more spiritual and, right, um, right. and, and being a source of, of inspiration, almost like like a, like a, like a geisha or something, you know, aside from like the, the, um, the prostitution aspect, which is yeah, the problematic thing. sexual aspects of the geisha. Yeah. But, but yeah, the, the geisha is like, like, like an art piece, you know, she's like the best possible version of a woman that you can be. And I, in this, the same thing, I, I, I think it happened with chivalry. It's like, like, okay, we're someone who's going to be like the divine mother, like, like Mary, yeah. that person is, is who I will go find the treasure for or she wants me to do this or she... so my point I, I guess my my question is like when when, when a when a civilization becomes more complicated uh I, I think the rules obviously the rules of the females and males become more complicated too right 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 and so if we're in a more barbaric society the women's position their role is more just a sexual slash motherly one but I think as it becomes more sophisticated, you develop something like chivalry and then you have women more, it's more of a leaning towards like the spiritual world. There's, there's more of like a um, transcendent, like there's, there's something you kind of see what I'm saying. Like, yeah, the divine feminine becomes more important in life. Yeah. And it's like, a say. yeah. And it's a source of inspiration and women yeah. I think are very integral in culture in this yeah. realm. That's not, that's not so physical so i i think just like throwing throwing um like the the female role is a really complicated one to figure out you know it's it's a hard one men it's a lot easier to see what it is that they're supposed well, to do I, I think it's true what paglia said once and i know people flipped out on that um especially like the uh the leftoids on twitter 
where she said that um i forget what book i think it may have been the vamp the vamps and tramps one uh she -hmm. said like men uh women have in essence men become meaning like men have to earn their sort of creativity and and wealth and richness of character whereas women already are endowed with certain attributes by virtue of nature and by the virtue of the development of the species and the fact that women have a lot of inborn and innate abilities because they're the ones who bear children and they have and they have to yeah and they have to possess a lot of already integral uh elements of their being Whereas men have to develop themselves. Men really don't achieve like value till later in life. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, it, a lot, no, like, but they hate that because nowadays it's like, that's, I know it's cliched and I know if you hang around like right wing discourse long enough, it becomes cliched, but it's true. Like w- people are terrified of that because it grates with like our modern, like egalitarian picture. And yeah. it's funny, like you were talking about chivalry because in a way, like, the system that we have now. And I think like it started off with our generation um, where it was much more acceptable for men to have like female friends that weren't necessarily romantic partners. Mm. And like, it was more acceptable. um, Like then the girl boss came out of like the millennial um, experiment, if you will. Um, (laughs) Yeah. You know, the aging millennial girl boss, why (laughs) not? Like the problem with, I think this sort of like hyper egalitarianism is that it really destroyed the sort of place of deference and speciality that women have in the sort of cultural, spiritual, and civilizational life of any society where men aren't going to like treat women any differently, you know, because they're women, uh, Mm -hmm. because we're told that that's evil and bad. And also it's also like an easy excuse to be like, well, we're both engaged in this like egalitarian, like consent based morality project. So if women have particular needs or emotions or desires and men have them, um, there's no place of speciality because speciality is evil by definition in this like, mm, that's know, a good analysis. Late stage society. Yeah. Yeah. No, because, that's a really good. Yeah. Well, like look at a culture, right? Like, like, okay, here's the thing. Now it's true that um, like men are also adversely affected by, what Bojer called the after the orgy society where like transgression is like everything has been transgressed to the point where nothing is transgressive. So we have to invent transgression. <laughs> yeah. um, and, and so like men are also equally affected by it, but men are kind of like men can compartmentalize certain things. Like, you know, not to say like, it's kind of like equally disgusting in a way if like a man like sleeps around a lot. But a man, mm-hmm. I think, like, we're more programmed to sleep around. But then, of course, like, I'm not, like, one of these, like, you know, rationalist nerds that talk about, like, Evo Psych and how, like, evolutionarily we're meant for promiscuity, blah, blah, blah. Like, that's, man is, like, more than just an animal, right? Like, humankind is more than just an animal. But yeah. I do think that men can sort of, like, compartmentalize promiscuity a lot better than women. Not to, not to say I'm endorsing it. Obviously, I don't. Mm-hmm. But I'm saying that, like, women have particular sensitivities and needs when it comes to um, not just the act of sex, but also the emotional baggage of sexuality and that um, women, I think as much as ideology tries to deny it, women inevitably have a different sort of um, compunction when it comes to these things. But then there are people that say like, you know, a lot of women, like, you know, younger women, they're more like, uh, they're more capable of like forsaking their own, like in like their own innate, like instincts for this like modern project. But then again, it's, I don't know. There's a lot of people that say that women are actually the more like Machiavellian when it comes to, uh, you know, relations, relationships and sexuality that in fact, women are probably. I think your analysis makes more, makes more sense. I, um, I see. I see what you're saying about how to, an extent, to an extent. To an extent. Well, yeah, because we're all humans, yeah. and I mean, we all have emotions and stuff like that. And men can, you know, get attached to people too. But, but this is why chivalry. I think it's so sad that it died off, or it's dying off, because something like, like marriage, like a higher expectation for for women, 
Yeah. You know, yeah. like like a feminist will look at that and they'll say, Oh, I'm gonna go parading in the streets with my top off, basically acting like like those women, those Viking type women, just like like sexual objects. What they don't understand is having a restriction on themselves means having a standard. So chivalry, marriage, all that stuff, like all, all those things that are these traditional ideas, they're it's not it's not to you're not free when you're like a slave to your devices. They don't exactly. Get that. That's what St. Paul said. Like that's yeah. Yes. Like desire in itself is a form of like serfdom, it, yeah. self serfdom. Yeah. And now, and now what's so sad is, is women, there's no expectation when you don't have an expectation for somebody it, that, that to me is sad. Chivalry was a way of saying, you know, if you were, if you were a woman who was, who was um, sophisticated in, in all of these ways, like we respected you. We have like a, a high opinion of you. And right, now right. it's been reduced to what? Like they were back to where we were. This is not a good thing. So. Um, yeah. My friend, Mary yeah. Harrington, she writes for the spectator. You, you'd really like her stuff. She talks about this all the time um, about like how, like the role of women um, has become degraded in society um, and, and like a very narrow band of like femininity is like worshipped and all the other aspects of femininity are sort of discarded or hidden. Um, mm -hmm. For example, like the sort of the, the, the tripartite, um, you know, Young talked about the tripartite of the, the maiden, the mother, the crone, the mother and the crone aspect. Now that the maiden has been extended to all ages, because even older women can become like can take like you know the e-girl for instance the e-girl can become like any can be at any age but the e-girl has a marker of like younger fe the young girl the young fem female mm -hmm. but all those other aspects whether it's the mother or the crone are erased or they're hidden or they're sort of um taken through the lens of the maiden the younger woman and so mm -hmm. yeah, i feel yeah. like those aspects of femininity, those are being actively um, like waged war against. And, and so a lot of, you know, women like, you know, this is again, when me and Catherine talk about like a lot of women um, who have different roles in life or who aren't conventionally attractive or who, um, but then again, unconventionally attractive is sort of like a weird thing because in some ways we have like the worst of both worlds because it's like, um, I know like the typical like manosphere critique of like feminist society, which I mean, a lot of it's apt of course, because mm -hmm. we have, um, I know this is a very vulgar term, but have you heard of the term pussylation? Um, yes. Okay. So I know what you're getting at. Yeah. Yeah. So in a sense, it's really strange how, when it comes to things like only fans and camming and other quote aspects of quote unquote sex work, Mm -hmm. how now the unconventionally attractive like girl next door like any woman can really have an only fans and they can find like a niche fetishistic market it's so which crazy. i yeah it's crazy <laughs> like in, in one sense i feel like i feel like it's not it's not it's obviously terrible because it's exploiting women yeah and it's it's it, but in the sense i think that i understand the need again like this goes back to what we were talking about jenny savile like I understand the need to celebrate women who in any other time period probably would be like, not a, like, okay. I understand the need to like celebrate, not celebrate, but like to recognize that, you know, ev average everyday women do not look like supermodels and yeah. that the standards created by, you know, by, by pornography in the beauty industry and mm -hmm. by, the elements of a very like spectacle driven, you know, hyper capitalist element of the human, the feminine image. I understand like the need to break away from that and that, you know, women that are average, like that they have a beauty within themselves and yeah. that, but uh, that being said, like those critiques are valid. And like, you know, even people like Naomi Wolf made these critiques back in the nineties, but then what do you do with that? Does that mean you open up an only fans? And say that, like, you know, the woman who is a bit pudgy and who has, like, you know, not very good skin, 
but she too can have an OnlyFans. <laughs> because that is that liberation, is that the reckoning? And so in a way, I think what Jenny Savile is doing, like, I mean, apart from like certain paintings where like we know what she's doing. She's doing the wink wink nod nod to like leftist ideology, especially when it comes to like European women engaging with um let's say non-European men. Um, you know, but when it comes down to it, I think what Jenny Savile is doing with the work of art is probably more healthy than like the average woman opening up an OnlyFans account. Well, it's the you know? same <laughs> thing. It, the same thing with Nick Akano Avocado. That's exactly yeah. the point. Is, exactly. Yeah. And, and so, so I, I do, I, I did use, uh, is it Savile or Savile? It's Savile. Either way. Yeah. Savile. Um, yeah. I, I always say Savile. Um, yeah. Savile is, yeah, probably better. Yeah. Um, I used her as I used her in one of my videos. Um, and to be I, fair, that was a very like graphic portrait because I believe uh, she painted um, this kid who was a victim of a landmine or something. Back well, okay. Day. The point, yeah. the point of doing that um, is to, is to just illustrate that like the filter, like everything that's filtering through to us, you know, uh, yeah. right now is all whether it's got some merit or not it's it's all very demoralizing that's, right that's right, right, right and right. why is it de why is it demoralizing and and i it, i i just um i like i i like her work and i think it has merit uh i actually find her to be quite respectable but she is like if we were going to look at an art piece or something like obviously like Wagner would be, I, I would say like a good, um, like a healthy, well-balanced uh, uh, type of art uh, right. representation of art that, and I really do think there is a healthy spot to be sitting in. J Jenny Seville is, is, is kind of a symptom of something that's happening, like a funk. Oh work. yeah, very much so. Yeah. So, but th that's not to say that her work is bad, but it's kind of just like the spirit of our time is, is that negative. And it's part of the same like spirit, like metaphysical sickness that we're experiencing. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's exactly it. So, so it's, I'm more alluding to that because that, that that's, that's not a healthy place for us to be. We, we, we shouldn't be, you know, you know, life isn't just suffering. Like there, there is, we should have a more balanced perspective of things. And I think there, there were times throughout history, you know, where, where we did have a more balanced, healthy, because you think about it, you know, people, they, they don't like um, kitsch for good reason. Cause kitsch right, is, right. it's, it's lame. It's fake emotion, but um and so, so basically what's happened is like, people will throw out all uh, drama. Like there's, there's, there's no room for drama. Well, in relation to white people, you know? So I, I think white people just have a really unhealthy perspective of, of themselves where yeah. they're not able to like go into the arena of having like balance with um, the bad things that can happen but also like the beautiful good things. Like there's, it's kind of like you're either or like you're, you're making kitsch or you're making like horror and there's like no balance and that's not good. Right. Right. You gotta see what I'm saying. So I, I don't dislike her and there's merit in Jenny Seville, but it's just that that's not a place we want to stay. It's not, it's not the resting place. Like everything is, I mean, it's, it's cyclical, you know, things are always like moving and changing all the time. But I just feel it's unhealthy. Don't you think? Oh, yeah, definitely. Definitely. Um, it's it's just like, uh, it's, <sighs> yeah, we're in a very, like, weird, like, nihilistic place right now. And I often think about this with my own art. Like, what am I putting out there? Um, and and what am I, um, like, like, what? as my influence on things because like a lot of pieces that i do i don't necessarily have like a 
like I do have a, a message, but like, I mean, sometimes a landscape is just a landscape. Like, I mean, yeah. there are a lot of works that I do that I feel um, do have like a sort of trying to put something out there, a message. But then I think like the problem is when you start to instrumentalize art in the service of ideology, that becomes like, you can do it, but I think like um, it has to be more subtle than just like this one-to-one -one relationship between what am I, what is this work of art expressing in terms of ideology and belief? And uh, I feel like nowadays I, I sympathize with people, like some of my friends even who are artists that say that there's no space to do like a political nice things. But as much as I'm sympathetic with that, I, I feel like um, there almost is like, as there, it's not that there's no room for that. It's just that I feel like, it would be um, not that you have to like, you know, you know, take up a position in the trenches of the culture war, but I feel like mm -hmm. um, as much as you, we want to escape that it's inevitability that any attempt to create something meaningful will ostensibly be sort of a, another like shelling point within this sort of grand spiritual culture war that we're engaged in all the time. So you feel like when, when you're actually, in the mode of making art, you you kind of feel like I'm trying trying to understand what you're saying. Do you kind of feel like you're not really like you feel like you might be contributing contributing in a way that you might not realize, like like maybe something negative yeah. might be coming out? Yeah, I think so because I think that um well, well with painting, but especially with printmaking, like there is like all of this, like the forethought that comes before the work of art, all that stuff I think like is mused upon and it only takes reflection. It really takes reflection after the work is completed to like truly sink in like, okay, yeah, what could be the possible interpretations of something? But when it comes to like actually creating a lot of like, a lot of like very technical decisions like occupies your consciousness in terms of like, like this is the difference between I think fine art and illustration and series work is that when it comes to fine art, there's like every single piece of the work of art becomes like a new thing that has a variety of challenges to overcome in terms of making something that approximates your vision. Cause it can never be like totally 100% unless you're like some kind yeah. of like, you know, hyper realist freak that has like very like, you know, fixates on technical skill. I think that every, yeah, every piece of art inevitably maybe doesn't exactly perfectly replicate what your mind's eye is telling you, but that's fine. You know, that's the nature. Yeah. Of well, well, Fen actually had um, a great post. Um, let me see if I can find it real fast. Um, Cause I've been, I, I, I'm do, I want to do uh, more um, with uh, like, aside from making videos and I'm 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 contending with these ideas too because that that is a struggle when when you're an artist it's like the process that yeah. that that can, that can uh, get pretty funky because you 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 can have a vision for something and then it doesn't necessarily end up yeah it doesn't uh, pan out at all yeah, yeah. or and writing is the different. same too writing is the same like there's a lot of ideas I have for articles but then like either through my own procrastination or my own like whatever. They don't sound like they don't come out right or they're like Yeah, same. <laughs> yeah, they're jumping. All the time. Um, well what Fen what Fen said was um making sculpture is an organic process. I set out with a belief uh, a, a brief idea and then I watch the piece grow and take shape. I try not to force anything. I always yeah. liked that Henry Moore said if I set out to sculpt a standing man and it becomes a lying woman, I know that I'm making art. And, and, and I think that's the struggle is like, ah, oh, it's, it's weird. Cause when, when you try to, when you try to come up with something sophisticated, like in your head, you, you have, um, you have these philosophical trains of thoughts and, and, right. and you, 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 you could almost like write an essay about like what it is you're going to do. I feel like it's almost nearly impossible to bring that into fruition because you know what Fen is getting at. It, it is an organic process. When you actually go to make an art piece, you're, unless you're like making a film, you know, with like a script or even like Kendrick Lamar, you know, that's the thing about rap music is 
it's very uh you can you can tell a story in a very uh could be very like objective and less subjective i, I don't know how to put it yeah there, there are some there are ones who are more like lyric like the the heavy like lyricists like big al for instance they could like really tell a story um, a complicated story yeah you yeah. could really like a concept album is you know pink floyd that's great but i mean when you get to kendrick lamar that's it, it that is a concept album uh, uh yeah a good kid mad city because that it's almost like when you listen to it it's almost like listening to a movie it's crazy and you can't do that with like it's harder to do that with the sculpture. It's harder to do that with a painting or or a song like, you know, where 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 you just you know it's a, it's not rap. I mean, it's, yeah, unless unless you're doing like series work. See, that's, yeah, yeah, in a fine art context, but like, like that's why I, I differentiate like illustration and design from like the work of art or like the 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 sort of fine art world because I feel like. I've said this before, like a lot of illustration is really like most people have seeded their aesthetic consciousness towards like illustration and animation and, and graphic design. And I feel like these are the people that like, I, I, I'm, I'm sort of fearful of the fact that fine art no longer occupies the public consciousness in the way it does, because I feel it like, doesn't. yeah, fine art itself. I mean, fine art it, it did it to itself. The art world did it to itself. But, well, well, it's a technological thing too. Like, yeah, that too. Yeah, the eyes just yeah. aren't there because, like, in, in the past, people they they would go to a church and they would see murals and and paintings as, as an extension, and it, I, that that just the eyes aren't there anymore. Like nobody's. That's why. I'm, that's why I was saying painting has almost become, uh, like gimmicky. Yeah. No, well, and that's not. I love painting. I, I I respect it, but it. So like, what what happened to me? Uh, it was really interesting. So in college, I I I'd gotten really good at painting. Like, like I, I, hmm. it, I like I can do almost hyper realistic if if I wanted to expend the energy. Um, I my my my, my on my dad's side. They're all gifted painters. They're really good. So I, I get that from them. I got so good at painting. And then I realized, you know, uh, oh, okay. Is this just about skill? What am I doing? Um, is painting really dead? What does that mean? And what I realized is that it, it's um, the eyes aren't there anymore. And 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 I, I looked at somebody like, as silly as it may sound, someone like Grimes, are you familiar with Grimes? Oh, I'm not. I'm not too familiar, but I know who she is. Yeah. Yes, it's Elon Musk's, I guess, former girlfriend. Um, yeah. I, I, I really, I really think that what she was doing was really interesting because she became. Uh, she's like a multimedia artist. She does, you know, the drawings or the paintings for her albums, and yeah. does the music and does the music videos and everything. And I, I guess that's kind of where my mind started going to like, okay, well, I'm a, I'm a portrait painter, but what relevance am I really going to have? Like, if I want to say something, who's really looking at, at painting anymore. And, and then I realized, okay, well, the direction I need to go in is I need to try to become a multimedia artist. So I, I, I really do think going into the future because, because technology has advanced the way that it has, not that painting will be totally irrelevant or sculpture or something like that. But I think if you're going to be a very relevant artist, that's going to have a lot of eyes on you and actually mm -hmm. like change things. I think in a lot of ways you do have to venture into multimedia. Like you, you kind of, kind of have to be like a, like a Jack of all traits sort of thing. Um, oh, no. I, oh no. What? Oh no. Do you disagree with that? Yes. <laughs> but that's my own like personal problem. Listen, coming from dude, listen, what happened to me was I, I, I was in college, my whole pursuit, like when I was a, a teenager, I, like 12, 12 years old up, 
I was painting. I'm going to, I'm going to do the traditional thing. I'm going to, I'm going to go to, you know, I, I wanted to be a painter and, yeah. um, and I, I had a, a massive existential crisis and like, I, I got so depressed. I dropped out of college and I had to, cause I realized we have all these issues. Like it's, it's not just philosophical. It's, it's also technological too. And that was right. something really difficult for me to reckon with. I mean, just think about it. You know, it's not like I, I'm a painter. So I, 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 that's originally what I was doing. So I, I feel for you, but you have to admit like, I've, it, the, the eyes just aren't there. Like, like, what are you trying to do at the end of the day? Are you trying to make something just for yourself or are you trying to get like, for lack of a better word, your, your train of thought into the ether? Like, like the zeitgeist, do you want to have an influence on the zeitgeist? In a way, yes. But in a way, like, I mean, it's, it's funny because I've really found myself also with printmaking with like woodcut and wood engraving. And, uh, it's that's, I, that more than painting in some ways, but it's really funny because I enjoy it and I use it in a way I like similar to like Edvard Monk and other artists. I use it in the German expressionist. Like I almost use it as a way of sketching, but at the same mm -hmm. time, like I, I don't have the same relationship to color the way that other painters do but I've been told by painters who have been doing it for a long time that I have a very like unique color sense, mm -hmm. even though I don't like have the same like obsession with uh, like the impressionist did with like, Oh my God, color. Oh my God. Like I don't have that same obsession, but at the same time I've been told that I'm really good with color, which I mean, I find kind of interesting. I, I mean, I, I guess I'm kind of contradictory because a lot of like my particular expressionistic style, like even though I'm Mediterranean, a lot of it comes from like Northern Europe, which is really weird. Cause I usually find like North European art kind of like off putting. That's except for like, Aryan in you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, but I do like love the German expressionists and Edvard Monk. And no, it's true. Like if you look at my art, like, um, you know, I, I, uh, a lot of it, um, is, uh, a lot of it's very close to like, a lot of like Northern European and Flemish artists. And uh, it's like, wow, holy crap. Uh, you know, like it's, especially with printmaking, like the German expressionists were always like a huge inspiration on me. Um, and and uh, so, yeah, I think like, I mean, yeah, you really, you are forced to do a lot of things. And it, like, you know, apart from that, being a writer and a podcaster and, and, you know, doing YouTube videos, like it's, it's, it is like you are forced to become something more unless you've been given sort of like the senecures of the, you know, remaining professional art world and you have the ability. What'd you say? I think, I think that world is dead. Like the, like it's the, dying. Yeah. The it, Tate, it all that stuff, like their, their influence is gone. Cause think about it. You, now you have Beeble crap and he, yeah. he oh, can, Oh God. Oh God. Like, you yeah. have to think about it. Nobody can, nobody will. Who's going to go to the armory show? Who's going to go, who's going to go to the, to a, a, a museum? It, 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 I mean, maybe for like, like, oh, Saturday with the kids, we'll go get, I don't, I don't know. It's not going to be like, like, I think it's like influence people like it used to. Like, yeah, now it's on all, Instagram. Yeah. Instagram, I think is like been a total detriment. I say this um, after having my Instagram account hacked and I have a new one now. But I was I really bummed that. about it. Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, I have a new one now, Giant Art Productions. Uh, so it's funny, like, the Instagram thing, because I feel like the professional art world had to, like, really rely on spectacles and, like, easily Instagrammable kitsch to, yes. like, become relevant. Like, the best example would be, like, the, the Kusama Infinity Rooms. Because, like, how many people, like, how many, like, like, you know, white girls on I've Instagram. been in one of those yeah like how many <laughs> yeah. Like, women on instagram like have a photo of themselves in the infinity rooms like it's yeah they need to rely on spectacles or they need to rely on like a lot of like art ho tropes to like you know become relevant again that's what they've been relegated to yeah. and they don't yeah. actually have 
any real influence on the, the zeitgeist. They, they don't. Um, the people who have an influence on the zeitgeist is Beeble Crab because yeah. he's getting tweeted out by Joe Rogan. And there's, it's, it's just where the eyes are, are focused on. Oh, that's People terrible. That's terrible. I mean, he's, it's true. So, so, you know, honestly, oh, man. <laughs> Beeple crap has more influence at this point than, um, than, um, um, who's uh, a Damian rock star. Hurst. Yeah. Or like Wolfenson or, uh, Jacob Geller. Yeah. Well, and, and if you think about like, what, what is it that's really happening? So what's happening is there's a person who like Fenn makes a sculpture and then he wants as many people to see that sculpture as, as he can in order to, right. in my opinion, to influence the zeitgeist. Well, it, it, where, where is everybody? Everybody is on the online they're all online and 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 like you're what you're doing is you're just taking you are making an image that means something and then you're putting it online it is right basic stuff but that's really all that's happening so whether it's in a painting form like now like your paintings i i can use photoshop and i can i, I can get a brush that that'll mimic the brushes that you're using and i could it, and people will look at it and they'll think it's real so th this, yeah but you can tell if you really look at it you can tell but well yeah okay to people like you and i that matters like yeah like, and a lot of my friends who are art. yeah a lot of my friends who are painters they also use like those brushes to like do a mock-up really quickly and it affords them like the ability to do something which i don't believe and i'm like kind of like as much as I rag on like vulgar tradism, I'm kind of a trad mm -hmm. in the sense like I don't even like tracing. I like to do everything like, <laughs> yeah, the hard same. way. Same. Yeah, because I feel like you know sketching is important. Yeah, and you have it really just atrophies your ability. And now that people are using like iPad programs to sketch, it's like ugh. Like I don't I'm know. Some it about it occasionally, and it's hard. It's really difficult. But you know what's you know it's gotten even worse because and it is actually very useful. People mm -hmm. would use um, like Blender, like animation programs to like position uh, uh, figures and then they'll make paintings that way. So like, yeah, some people can yeah. use it really well. Like I know the, that one kid that does the, uh, the, the backrooms mythology, like oh, what's his name? Came pixels, came pixels. Yeah. Like I know people are doing some really innovative things just with Blender. Um, and, and creating like whole, like I would say internet mythopoetics. Mm. Um, and I think that's very valuable. Um, but I guess like, okay, so this jumps off to what I wanted to ask you about your own work. Um, first of all, I think like in terms of the feminine thing, uh, in terms of the woman question, mm. um, I, I noticed like you don't like you have a, a, in some sense, you have like the aesthetics of a lot of the e-girls, the early yeah. internet stuff, but you're not an e-girl. I don't think, I think that no, I you don't, don't have, you have a very like, um, you have a very like, to be blunt, you have like a very like modest and honest approach to your own, like, uh, like you have a very modest and, and confident approach to your own image as a woman. And there isn't like a lot of like overt, expressions of like sexuality as a sum factor in no. fact you, you assume that and i feel like you don't play into like a lot of the tropes of the e-girl being this eternally available imagio for male desire and also for oh, i mean desire of other women but that's a complicated thing um it, i noticed like you you have like um a very unique approach to the way that you use filters and the way that you portray yourself and the way that you have this character that um, in some ways at the beginning was naive and, and innocent. And uh, you don't like you have, um, you have a very unique relationship to your own self as a woman. And I wonder if like you could comment on that, like if it's a conscious thing or it just comes from your sensibility or, or something else. No, that's, it. it's cool that you noticed 
um, all of that. Because that I, I don't think I've ever had anybody really notice what it, what it was that I was trying to do. Um, mm. But but yeah, that's um, I'm very aware of um, of what any girl is, and I don't think it's for me. I it, it's. I think it's a respect thing. Like I, I want respect from the audience. Mostly, my my audience is men. Right. Uh, right. I, yeah. And and for me, you really have to. I've always just felt like as a woman, I, I wanted to to gain respect uh, from people right. legitimately. Right. And I and I've never used my femininity uh, to like. I mean, you like flirt and stuff. You know, like so, sometimes people do that. Everybody kind of does that. But I don't use my femininity in order to to make gains in life. So, right. And I just feel like going forward, I don't think that that's the trajectory that we should be going on. Like where women are doing that, I think that's actually a part of the problem. Women should be becoming more sophisticated. So, for for me, it's it. I could, if I wanted to, I could really like play that up. Definitely. Oh you know? yeah, no doubt. I, I, I could do I'm it. not being a simp, but you know, <laughs> it is what it is, is what it is. <laughs> Thank you everyone for listening to the Content Minded Podcast. If you wish to support me and to unlock every full and uncensored version of each week's podcast, please go to patreon.com slash Productions. You will not only get every full and uncensored version of Content Minded, but you will also get exclusive content, such as my Giner Reviews series, where I analyze and pick apart various interesting and insightful books or essays. Every episode will be uploaded to Anchor, which will upload them to Spotify, as well as my backup channel on Odyssey. Please look out for new content every single week, and please look out for The Digital Archipelago with me and The Prudentialist. Thank you once again to all of my beautiful patrons. Thank you all for keeping the content renaissance alive. As I always say, God bless and goodbye.